Are we on? Yeah. Uh, call to order the regular meeting of Monday, January 14, 2013 of the Tiverton Town Council. We'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mrs. Mello? Councilor Gerlach? Present. Councilor Ruda? Present. Councilor Shabbat? Present. Councilor Lambert? Present. Councilor Roderick? Present. Councilor Pelletier? Yes, ma'am. Councilor De Madeira is, is absent. Okay, we'll uh, begin with a uh, town council proclamation recognizing Cardi's furniture. Town of Tiverton, Rhode Island, proclamation. Whereas Cotty's Furniture has been a family-owned business since 1928, and whereas Cotty's Furniture has received numerous certificates of appreciation for outstanding support, and whereas Nicholas Cotty Jr., Ron Cotty, and Peter Cotty, and the staff of Cotty's Furniture have shown continued generosity for over 10 years for Toys for Tots, and whereas the United States Marine Corps Reserve through Toys for Tots program has been providing many children from Tiverton as well as children from the area with toys and whereas the town of Tiverton is grateful and appreciative of those services. Therefore, be it resolved that we take this opportunity to express our heartfelt appreciation and congratulate Nicholas Cotty Jr., Ron Cotty, and Peter Cotty and the staff of Cotty's Furniture on being able to provide for the less fortunate and be it further proclaimed that the, town, that the Tiverton Town Council does recognize the services of Nicholas Cardi Jr., Ron Cardi, and Peter Cardi, and the staff of Cardi's Furniture, and encourages all Tiverton re residents to join the Tiverton Town Council in thanking and recognizing Cardi's Furniture for their numerous philanthropic efforts. Uh, for the Tiverton Town Council, by my Council President, Edward A. Roderick, January 14, 2013. Congratulations. We appreciate their support. <coughs> Uh, the con consent agenda, uh, business brought before the council. We have uh, approved minutes of the regular council meeting December 10th, 2012. Approval of the executive session minutes of December 10th, 2012. Approval of special meeting January 7th, 2013. Receipt of minutes from the following boards and commissions, Board of Canvassers, Wastewater Management, Historical Cemeteries, Library Board of Trustees, Tiverton Prevention Alliance, Art Council, Cassett Cemetery Commission Planning Board, correspondence received in file, Sakonet River Bridge Resolution from the City of Fall River regarding tolls, Sakonet River Bridge Resolution from the Town of Portsmouth regarding tolls, City of Fall River City Council Veterans Liaison regarding Sakonet River Bridge, uh, Evan Smith, President and CEO of Discover Newport, submitting a letter by Diane Hurley, CEO of Newport Grand regarding the tolls on the Sakonet River Bridge. CA4, Kate Mishad, Planning Board Administrative Officers, December Activity Report. Denise Sarout, Treasurer, November 2012, Revenue and Budget Reports. Tiverton Conservation Committees, Notice of Workshops regarding State of Our Waters, uh, which will be Wednesday, January 16, 2013. Uh, is there any changes or deletions from the consent agenda? Thank you for uh, handing out the uh, the uh, planning board meeting with the, the floor. Okay, uh, seeing none, we'll entertain a motion. So, we have a motion. Second. And a second. All in favor? <coughs> motion is passed. <coughs> Open public forum and announcements. Uh, Mrs. Pelletier. Hi everyone, um, Barbara Pelletier, um, Barneyfield Drive. And first of all, I want to thank whoever the wonderful spirit was. As you know, I wanted to get a comment up on Fort Barton, which with no electricity up there, et cetera, et cetera, became such a big problem that I almost, well, I did give up. But then just before Christmas, some wonderful elf and spirit appeared on Main Road, on Highland Road, and strung a star or a comet across the road here. And it was one of these things, oh my God, it can happen. 
And somebody embraced the spirit and showed where there's a will, there's a way. And it was one of my most wonderful Christmas gifts this year. And truly, thank you, thank you, whoever did it. The more important thing is, I think, our way of expanding our tax base by bringing in tourists through this brochure that we are hopefully going to have out by February, end of February. And even though we have all of these m magnificent settings, we really don't have much for people from the outside to utilize them. It's okay if you have a house here and a boat and a this and a that, but there's really very little that we can, as a stranger to this area, even know about. And believe it or not, I've spent almost two months trying to find ways of doing, getting people interested, and you just get the feedback, no, I'm no longer interested in doing business in Tiverton. I've had a bad experience. And it's sort of a chicken and egg kind of thing. What do you have first? Some tourists that may not want to come because there's nothing to do. But if you have something to do, the people certainly aren't going to put out their money and put something up that's an iffy question. So I, I would encourage that we make it easy in town to open a business. We lay out opportunities, for instance, uh, down at the new, um, well, to the sto old stone bridge that we're going to put a pier on. Maybe we can, right now, before it's even completed, say, well, here's a potential. We will help you get all of your, um, all of your permits or something, an easy way to do the permitting. We might even give you tax exempt for the first three years so you can get yourself established. Anything that will make us friendly for business. I don't, I don't quite un know if you understand what I'm trying to say because it, it was a pretty miserable feedback and very discouraging because at the end I came to the conclusion we should combine our little leaflet with Little Compton so that at least there are boat rentals in Little Compton. There are more venues almost, like the nice little town center, and all kinds of these things that we don't have in Tiverton. But if they run through Tiverton to go to Little Compton, we might catch them. You never know. So all of this, including harbor tours and that, as things in the future that we could work upon, we could encourage people, we could say, Gee, you know, if you do this, we'll be so proud of you, and we won't, we won't envy you. We won't throw a monkey wrench in your face because you're successful. I think we should all take this pride in all of us doing well. For some reason or other, I think it might work for us because tourism is a big money producer in, in the sense of uh, taxes and all of that, and we don't have any hotels or legal bed and breakfast or whatever. We just don't. So we should systematically kind of figure it out, but not take five years and just get going with it. Um, we certainly shouldn't even sell off our <coughs> assets right now that might help us in the future. And we do have several areas like the little um, Four Corners, which in itself is going to be sold, but we should look at the places around there, such as Nongu, which I realized was going to come up again. But that might be a venue to eventually develop at least as a hotel and not as a private residence. But I suspect it's a done deal or done decision. So um, I just don't want to look, us to look back as a town in five years and say, gee, that could have been. We had a chance because you never recoup some of these chances. Uh, that's all I have to say. And in case you are getting rid of Nongkwit, here is a bug from the Historical Society with Nongkwit on it and some little chocolate candies. And the bugs are actually supposedly good luck. And uh, good luck in Germany, ladybugs. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Pelletier. But think about how, how we can make it work and you know, ironically, somebody sent me a Christmas card and it says, a snowflake is one of the most fragile creations, but look 
what they can do when they stick together. We'll have a blizzard and here we go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, public hearings and public presentations. Marcel Velwa, Economic Development Foundation, Update and Progress and Direction of the Tivitin Business Park. Welcome, Mr. Velwa. Good evening. Mr. President, members of the Town Council, uh, maybe an introduction or reintroduction may be in order because I know there's uh, some new members of uh, the Council. Uh, I appeared here several months ago to update the, uh, the council on the status of the uh, Tiverton uh, Business Park and some of the work we're doing with it. And um, I know there's been some new council persons, so I'm going to take some time just to kind of recap the discussion uh, we had la at the last meeting and also touch on some of the things that we've accomplished uh, uh, since that last meeting. But I just want to take the, the time also to introdu introduce a team. Um, that, that asked me to, to, to be involved in this project, uh, you know, working with Len Schmidt from the town's uh, Economic Development Commission. Uh, John Riendo is here tonight. John Riendo is with the Rhode Island Economic Development Corporation, who's been very helpful in uh, guiding on this project. And also Jody Sullivan, who's the president of the Newport County Chamber of Commerce, who has been instrumental in getting federal funding to help do some of the design work around the Tiverton Business Park. Uh, several months ago, they asked our foundation, the Economic Development Foundation of Rhode Island. We're a private, nonprofit development company that has expertise in business park development. Uh, we've done a number of projects uh, in the state of Rhode Island. They've asked us to come and give some advice to the town on how we might be able to reposition the Tiverton project uh, to get it moving forward. Uh, I know this project has been uh, dormant for a number of, of years in the town, uh, and we took a very hard look uh, at the engineering and the layout and the design work of this project. Uh, for, for new members, uh, this project is 177 acres off of Fish Road Route 24. Um, of that 174 acres, after all the engineering analysis was done, there's only about 100 acres of really developable land. The rest of it is either wetlands or, or areas of steep slope or, or uh, rock outcropping. So we've targeted about 100 acres of development uh, on the site. Uh, the town was fortunate to get an SBA grant as a result of hard work by the Newport County Chamber of Commerce, and the whole site was actually engineered, 100% engineered, and went through your planning board and your subdivision process and in fact got all final approvals. Not only did it get its subdivision approval, but it received all its approvals from the state and DEM in terms of a master plan drainage system for the entire park. So uh, congratulations to the town, it's very aggressive. Uh, most towns don't have the, uh, the leadership to take, take a project to that level. When we took a look at the project, we, had, we worked with the engineers to put a price tag on what it would cost to build it as designed through the subdivision process. <clears throat> and the, the numbers came in and we reported back at the town council at the last meeting, it came in over $9 million. Uh, we were asked to take a look at it to see if there's a way we can bring that cost down. So we developed a second option, we refer to option two, where we lowered the, the amount of public infrastructure in, in the project. We've lowered, we've cut back the number of roadway segments in the project uh, to a point where we were able to bring the price down to maybe three and a half to five million dollars, depending on what uh, amenities we add into the, into the package. So we've cut the cost down to 50 to 60 percent. Uh, but what that has done is, is instead of the town putting all the public infrastructure, all the roads, the drainage systems, everything in place, they only put a modified portion of the improvements and, and down the road as you sell individual lots, some of the developers of those lots will have to actually build their own uh, storm drain systems on, on their property. So you're passing the cost on to future uh, investors in the industrial park. Um, also as a result of that, we've, uh, the, the town's approach was to create these little 40,000 square foot lots. Uh, we found that the market is really, uh, if you look at uh, business parks that have been developed over the last 15 or 20 years throughout south, southeast and New England, the average size of a lot is closer to two or three acres. So we created larger lots that can accommodate 20 to 30,000 square foot buildings. That seems to be the soft spot or the sweet spot in, in, the, in the marketplace. 
So in doing that, we've redesigned it. We have option two, we have a 21 lot subdivision, small lots uh, ranging from two acres. There's one lot that's 25 acres that allows you to sell it to a developer who can actually build a little campus style development and for smaller users in condominium type uh, development. Since the last meeting of the council, uh, we have worked with uh, your, your town administrator, your town manager, Jim, and, and, and with the state, and we've uh, tried to identify several federal funding sources that could help you defray some of these costs. Uh, we had a conference call with the U.S. Department of Commerce Economic Development Administration, with the state, with uh, the Chamber of Commerce, and with town officials to see if they would uh, co-invest with the town to do some of this uh, infrastructure uh, investment. EDA is in place to uh, invest in projects that will help your economy. That's what they've, that's what they've done for, for decades. The nearest project that they invested in uh, in this area, uh, the Equidnik uh, Island Industrial Park or Business Park, that whole park was created back in the 1990s using e EDA funding. Uh, Quonset Point received a lot of EDA funded for bulkhead improvements and road improvements in, at Quonset Point. Uh, the project that we've, uh, we've worked on for the last 10, 15 years, the Highland Corporate Park with CVS is located in Cumberland. Those public improvements were funded partially by the Economic Development Administration. So we're, we're aware of the, the, that entity and, and some of the good work they do. Uh, we had a conversation with the regional administrator for EDA to introduce them to the Tiverton project. And this is a type of project that they typically invest in. They like public works type projects. Uh, but it was very clear, and it has been for, for as long as I've known uh, EDA, that there's a matching share, that they will not fund 100% of these improvements, that they usually fund 50% of the project costs. And the average project size throughout the country is around $2 million. So if we look at a $5 million <coughs> project, which is the revised cost estimate for option two, and 50% of that $5 million, it comes pretty close to what EDA is t typically funds. And, and they have expressed an interest. Now, to get EDA funding, you have to submit a significant application to the federal government. It's not, it's complicated. But they uh, strongly suggested that we don't even go through the process unless we are able to show firm commitment from the town that says that if you give us a federal grant for 50 percent, we have our local match lined up for you. So it's a chicken and egg type of situation. So they are eager to uh, uh, entertain a, a proposal from the town. It is a type of project they want to invest in but they would like to see from the town a commitment that the, the local match, the two and a half million dollars, will be there. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's, it, it, they don't recommend that we start, we start the, uh, the process. Even though this is the type of project they invest in, Economic Development Administration is also called upon for disaster relief. And we all know that in the past uh, several months, there has been some significant disaster problems, in, in, especially in the Northeast with, the, 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 with Sandy. And a lot of that money is going to get redirected, I think, to some reconstruction under the, um, the disaster relief program. So the money will be tight, uh, but what we know about this project is that, uh, of any project, is that if you have the engineering completed, if all the approvals are in place, and if you have the local match, you usually make it up to the top of the list very quickly because a lot of communities don't have the ability to provide an application with all that information in place. The second thing we've done, uh, uh, we've contacted the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture <coughs> through their rural development programs that invest typically in water and sewer <coughs> projects uh, for rural communities. Because you're such a big metropolis here in Tiverton, uh, your population exceeds 10,000 and therefore you are not eligible under the rural development program as a town to receive infrastructure funding for sewer work or water or sewer work in this particular case. Uh, so we've talked with USDA and we recognize that you have a, a fire district, North, North uh, Tibden Fire District in town that in fact has received rural development funding in the past for water improvements. That's because the size of their area is much smaller than 10,000 in population and they become eligible. 
and we were talking about potentially using them as a vehicle, even though they're a water commission, using them as a, uh, as a vehicle to do maybe some of the sewer work, but it may require us to go through the General Assembly and get a change in their scope, uh, their, their enabling authority from the General Assembly. But it's kind of a concept that we're working on. The rural development f uh, funding approach, would they, would they would fund up to 45% of a public improvement in this case, we're looking specifically at sewer work, bringing a gravity line, a gravity sewer line from the pumping station on Industrial Road um, up through the industrial park. Uh, the cost of that, and I think I've included that in the memo I gave to the town council, is uh, in excess of a million dollars, but that includes a 20% contingency built into that project cost. So again, the typical, I mean, similar to the uh, Economic Development Administration, the Rural Development uh, group is also looking for proof or, or some evidence of a local match uh, be in place before we go through that, that planning process. The other thing we looked at is whether there's any private money that we can get uh, in the project. And Jim and I had a very, I think, construct, uh, the very constructive meeting with the Tivit and Power, which is the gas to energy power plant that's located up in the uh, park. They have expressed over, over the over time some interest in if the town ever tie ever put sewers in they would like to tie in because they have a significant amount of outflow from their facility that they have to dispose of now in different ways and it's getting very expensive so maybe it's could be uh, cost effective for them to tie into a sewer line and help defray some of those costs we've begun those discussions uh, with Tiffin and Power they're very open-minded about possibly investing with the town but they have to do a cost-benefit analysis to see if if they tie into a gravity line sewer that's installed, will that save money over time and help uh, help them come up with some of the money that they need uh, as their local share? Uh, the town has, uh, I, Jim has been working with the sewer commission, has had conversations with them, and will also have conversations with the city of Fall River to see what the fee structure would be like for Tivit and Power to see if this makes any sense. The intent here is if it makes sense for Tiffin and Power to front some of the money to help us put the sewer line in. We can match that with rural development funds and come close to matching what we need to get uh, for the sewer line. So they we're working on a number of funding uh, schemes to help the, 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 the town defray the cost. It doesn't make sense for the town to spend nine plus million dollars. They will not see a return on that investment for a very long time. It makes a lot more sense if we can reduce those costs down below five million and then it makes even more sense if we can get half that money defrayed by the federal government through direct investment. If you're going to put a two and a half million dollar investment and be able to develop over the next 10, 15 years, 100 acres of land that could accommodate a million square feet of space, just the tax and the revenue from, uh, from that development uh, makes a lot of sense, can, can very easily be shown to have a very good return on your, your investment. So the next step on this project is, as you can see, there's a theme here, and that is if the town wants to pursue developing this project, there's a number of ways they can go about doing it. They can go out and try to sell the property as is to see if somebody out there in the private world will take the whole project and do something with it. That may be worth a shot. It would be, if you're gonna do that, I would say suggest that you do it on a regional and national basis, not just in the local region, to see if anybody, if uh, comes up and just waves their hand and says, yes, we'd love to have 100 acres of land right off of Route 24 in Tiverton. Um, it's unlikely you're gonna get major development interest uh, at, at this point in time, uh, just given the, the nature of the economy and the fact that there's plenty of competitive property in southern, southeast New England that would probably compete for that kind of investment dollar. But it may be worth a shot. Uh, the second uh, alternative is to um, actually develop it your, your, yourselves. Land, or another alternative should be land bank it and wait till the economy gets better. Maybe the values will go up and, and the, uh, the project will become even more feasible. A uh, third one is to develop it yourself and to maybe identify, try to identify some way to raise two and a half million dollars locally that can match the federal money where we can put in the public infrastructure and create the environment there that we, that, that we can actually start selling property. You don't have a sewer line in that project. You're not likely to sell a piece of land and get development unless you put that sewer line in. So you're gonna to have to start doing some investment in that project if you're gonna um, get a position to sell. Uh, so we, uh, 
I mean, that, in summary, that's you know that's where we are with the project. Uh, we, the foundation, is ready, you know willing to work with the town to put together federal applications if necessary to get the federal funding. But we're going to have to identify how we're going to get that two and a half million dollar share if we're going to do that option two project. Uh, Mr. Valois, how long is the process? You know, once the application is in, how long does it normally take? Uh, the application, the EDA takes their applications in quarterly. Uh, it, if this project is so far advanced that if we had the local share and we went in with the application, it, I think it would be complete. And you can get funding as quickly as six months to a year. That, de that all depends on if there's money in the pot. Right. And obviously with the disaster relief, we don't know what, what, the, what that's going to look like several months down the road. But I think you, if you have a complete application, it would be six months to a year to get the matching funds. But again, they won't even take the application unless you have a commitment that the town has the money lined up for the, uh, for the matching share investment. Is the, uh, is the 1.2 million for the gravity fed sewer line part of the 2.5? Yes, it's, it's okay. a, the $5 million project Included in that is the sewer work. Okay. So two and a half would cover the sewer. Would cover the sewer work. It would cover bringing in gas lines. It covers some sidewalk work in the project, the repaving of the road, some landscaping, and there's a few s small segments of roadways that are going to get built as part of that. And it includes the building of uh, two small retention ponds so that you can actually start selling some of the acreage uh, that would be totally permitted uh, and ready for sale. Sorry, just a couple more questions. Yeah, so <clears throat> back in paragraph one here where you talk about option two, <clears throat> you, you talk about the town needing to weigh the importance of looped access within the park. So my question is, what's the risk from a development perspective, the attractiveness of a development perspective of not including that loop? Is there, can we substantiate that risk? And is, what is what would be potentially the future cost to go in and retrofit that? Would we end up having to pay more at a future stage to kind of retrofit? There are two issues. And maybe it's easier to. This was the original, and I'll just point out the, the original subdivision. You can see all the gray area. Those are all roadways that were going to be built by the town. That's right. a $9.2 million option. Mm -hmm. And included in that is this long segment of road that basically just loops the park back to industrial way. So when it's a, the two things the planning board asked for is this loop system. That's to ease the traffic flow. The only problem with that is that it brings the traffic right back to the same, that same intersection. Mm -hmm. Most parts of this size, this size would have two ways out both to another main artery. In this case, you're bringing it right back to the same location. So from a traffic flow point of view, I don't think you're achieving that much by eliminating that second loop. The, the second issue here is these right of ways into adjoining lands. Mm -hmm. And good planning, and the planning board did its job, good planning suggests that if you're going to develop any kind of subdivision, whether it's residential or, or commercial or industrial, you always want to think ahead and how does this roadway pattern tie in with future roadway patterns? And I think the intention here was to make sure that we accommodate that future planning. Some of this, this the option uh, two eliminates a lot of these cul-de-sacs and prohibits you from having these connections into adjoining lands. So that's something that the town has to weigh and discuss and kind of think about in terms of long-range planning. So those are two separate issues. I don't think the traffic issue is a big deal. The connections into adjoining lands is something I think the town needs to sit around the table and discuss later before we proceed on this. Just one more question. <clears throat> to President, President Roderick's point about the time frame, is there any kind of hypothetical master timeline that's been drafted that might have play this out over the next couple of years that takes into consideration key dates such as, you know, an EDA application process, just kind of starts to lay all this out and coalesce it into a loose type of plan.
plan that kind of makes things a bit more easier to digest? Yeah. We, we, there's nothing on paper now, but that's certainly easy to do. Of course, the, the trigger here is the funding. Um, well, that would be something that I would, I would want to try to build into that. So if we're strategizing about how to approach this, you know, everything's mapped out, and we can think about if we were to proceed, you know, how best to try to plug that particular swim lane of work into the overall project. And we, we can prepare a, a timeline, but just for tonight's discussion, six months to a year to get the financing piece in line. Right. Mm -hmm. Construction is anywhere between, this could be about a nine, ten month construction project if you hit the seasons right. And then in uh, a, a previous uh, cost benefit analysis, we were looking at a ten year build out. Mm -hmm. That okay. means how long would it take for us to make substantial, he substantial headway in selling uh, the real estate to ten year build out of that project. But I'll, I'll put that in a timeline for you. Uh, in my next report to the council. Thank you. Any other questions from the council? Mm -hmm. Jim? Mm -hmm. Jim? Right. Again, thank you, uh, Mr. Valois, for your work, and uh, we look forward to seeing that timeline. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, th I think we had one before. We just discussed the council. Uh, acting as a Board of Licensing, we have Jeffrey T. Nagel, 330 South Christopher, request approval of annual renewal of private detective license, subject to meeting all legal requirements. Is Mr. Nagel here? Mr. Nagel did not return the uh, required legal documents regarding the background check. Could we table that or move it to another date, please? Uh, or whatever the Madam Clerk decides that she has to do at this point. Mm -hmm. His license is expired. Yeah. Yeah, when we continue it, I'll try to reach him. And if he doesn't have any documents available by the next time, we'll just remove it. Andrew, okay. his, his license is did recall him a couple times. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. His license has expired. Are we running in um, kind of a no, his license is expired. He, he can't be working right. okay. currently. Mm -hmm. And if he's not here and hasn't contacted us, then he's going to have to wait two more weeks. Okay. Okay, we'll... Uh, Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief. We'll move this to our uh, next meeting. What's the date, Nancy? 28th. The 28th. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Okay, appointments and resignations. Uh, first, we have interviews of Board of... For boards and commission vacancies advertised for appointments on January 14th. Uh, the first one is economic development, uh, Michael S. Burke. Mr. Burke has asked that his name be uh, removed. Uh, he has some uh, commitment, so we graciously thank him for his uh, interest, but uh, he has asked that his name be uh, removed from consideration. Uh, next is the Stone Bridge Committee. Mary, and please uh, forgive me if I say this incorrectly, Zipaneski. Not we here. have tried to contact Ms. Zipniewski several mm -hmm. times and we haven't received any response at all. So <coughs> she's on there because it was a reappointment. Mm -hmm. she's, we have, we've sent email, letter, and phone calls. Okay. So I would suggest you move on that. Um, uh, well, I, I don't know how long we want to wait on this. Um, I, I would suggest we send her a register because letter. We have another applicant that has come before you yep. Is, yeah. the, is, is that oh, make, that makes two, so. doesn't it? Mm. Or is that would would we be filling her vacancy, or is that in addition to a vacancy that already exists? It would be filling her vacancy. Okay. Her renewal was up last June. Oh, we okay. haven't been able to get her to right. confirm that. Mm -hmm. okay. She's interested. She's interested. So can we send her a registered letter? Registered letter. You want yeah. To send it? Sure. Send the registered letter. Asking her. We're not going to certified. This certified. <laughs> I'm showing my age. Yeah. Uh, we we have have that. Uh, well, well, I think I, well, I think this one where it's been so long, you know, where, where we've asked and asked we and asked, and, asked ago, right? and had still got no response. And and yeah. 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 Maybe she's just not interested. Okay. Yeah. We're going to postpone an, an appointment though that of an applicant that has been wanting to get on this board for a number of months. 
I'm going to do whatever the council tells me to do on this case. But we have made every effort repeatedly to reach Ms. Sipnewski. There's no response. Well, I would just speak for myself in saying that if we have someone who is able and willing and we have someone who is who is to this point not been responsive to our requests and whose appointment expired how long ago? At least six months ago. At least six months yeah. ago that maybe we just trudge forward. I would agree with that. Then uh, what's the pleasure of the council on that, that uh, we uh, remove Mary Zipaneski's uh, name from consideration? Okay, then um, then you don't have to send the certified letter then. I will just send a letter right. saying we appreciate yeah. the work she's put in this. She has been on the yep. committee. We do send mm -hmm. Okay, then moving along. Appointments to boards and commissions. Juvenile hearing board. One vacancy for alternate expiring 10-13-2013. We have an applicant, uh, Ms. Donna Cook, 192 Hilton Street. Uh, she has been interviewed. It is the council's pleasure. I move that we appoint Donna Cook as an alternate for the Juvenile Hearing Board to fill a vacancy expiring 10-13-2013. Second. We have a motion to second. All those in favor? Opposed? Congratulations, Ms. Cook. Stonebridge Committee, one vacancy expiring 4-15-2015. We have an applicant, Harris Gruber, 345 Hancock Street. Is Mr. Gruber here? Just, just so we, I, I remember you, I just want everybody else to see you. Just stand. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Gruber. You've ar you've already passed the uh, We've been interview portion. Interview already, yes, we yeah. have. Is but I just I just wanted like to know? no, just wanted people to be able okay. to see you. Okay. <laughs> okay. I would uh, move that we approve appoint uh, Harris Gruber to the Stone Bridge Committee for uh, the vacancy expiring uh, for term expiring for 15 2015. Okay. We have a motion. Second. We have a second. All those in favor. Motion carries. Congratulations, Mr. Gruber. Welcome. We thank you for your interest. Economic development. One vacancy expiring 7-15-2015. Uh, as previously stated, uh, Mr. Michael Burke uh, has requested his name be taken out of consideration. We have Susan Gill, 1392 Main Road, as one of the applicants. Is Ms. Gill here? Okay. Uh, the chair will entertain a motion. I move that we appoint Susan Gill to the Economic Development Committee for the vacancy expiring July 15th, 2015. We have a motion. Second. And a second. All those in favor? Post motion carries. Uh, please send our congratulations to uh, Ms. Gill. Oh, um, yes. President, I did um, send a not on your agenda, but just to keep it in mind for the next one, I did receive two um, correspondence for the council. One was the coalition, the Civil Intervention Coalition, asking that a council member become a liaison mm -hmm. uh, to that committee. They, uh, they haven't had one since Mrs. Aruga. And the other one was the Newport Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Madison used to be. I was going to ask you about that tonight. They have sent a letter asking for a council liaison. Okay. Well, that doesn't have to be. Yes, it does. It's oh, the, yeah, the, it's the, it's the board director. Right. So there's mm -hmm. two for council liaison. If anyone is interested, please contact me so we can put it on the next agenda. Mm -hmm. Let the council know and I'll inform you. Just yeah. put, it on the put them both on the next agenda. Put them both on? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> if you would, please. Thank you. Okay. I need to direct you. Okay. To. Unfinished business. Councilor Gerlach. Sure. <coughs> well, um... <laughs> At our last meeting, we had, we had at least one takeaway coming off of that, and that was to try to figure out who has the legal authority to enforce what might be the, the current regulations regarding 
uh, water safety at Stafford Pond. And Andy, I know you were going to go off and try to figure that out. Do we have any update on that? Um, yes, I do. I, I don't have a written report for you yet, but I do have some preliminary information on it. Um, there, there's two levels of possible regulation here. The, the first one is <laughs> if we can determine the owner of the bottom of the pond, <laughs> the owner of the pond would have certain rights, including to prohibit anybody from being on it at all. Um, or not to put any regulation. What we, what we believe we have now is since nobody knows who the owner is, the owner has no regulations. And as far as the state law, it falls to DEM. So I'm going to come back to that in a moment. But I am saying that we are still looking to try to see who could be the owner. Apparently, this was a s topic of a lawsuit in the late 18, 1980s, uh, ending about 1990. Um, dealing with the fire district, but it was all about drawing water from the pond, the use of the water, the water rights, if you will, which is usually not a legal issue we deal with in this part of the country. Um, and apparently it was settled without any settlement of who owned the bottom of the pond, but I'm still looking into that to try to find out what clues that could put there. Um, what I've been told is that this Watapa there was a Watapa something, might be Watapa Manufacturing, uh, had it. They're defunct. Now the city of Fall River thinks that they have it. But I don't know for sure where it has gone, what, what, what passage has gone to those things. So that's something we're pursuing. Um, the other issue of regulatory power is the General Assembly has <coughs> given the authority over the ponds such as this to the Department of Environmental Management, DEM. <coughs> and they have their regular regulations. But state law provides um, the department of the, the, basically the DEM is responsible for the environmental quality of the water and the Department of Health is responsible for maintaining the safety of the drinking water supply. Um, and state statutes specifically forbid any activity that will pollute or corrupt or impair the purity or quality of a public drinking water supply or which renders the water supply injurious to health or poses a significant risk to public health. Um, and the local body that's charged with coordinating this is basically the Conservation Commission. And obviously I think we're on the way to that with the meeting Wednesday night dealing with that. Um, but the Conservation Commission can petition DEM to impose stricter rules and regulations on a water supply than they would apply in general. Um, so that would presumably be the way to do it. Um, as a practical matter, it also may make sense to try to, you know, use our political influence with our legislators and whatnot or, 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 or with just the town talk to the governor or the director of administration. It really seems to be a communication problem. We've got two different halves of DEM, you know, one stocking fish and the other one concerned with water quality and then the Department of Health, and if we could get both sides of DEM and the Department of Health all in one room together, um, we might be able to get somewhere. So that's the direction that we're heading. If Mr. Gerlich, if I can be just brief. Absolutely. I'll give you, I'll, it'll just take me one minute. Uh, I, after Mr. Gerlich raised this issue, I contacted a friend of mine who's now the, John Fryer, who's now the head of water, the water department in Fall River, Massachusetts, and has been for a number of years, uh, because I, he's also a, something of a history buff, uh, so knows the history of the uh, Stafford Pond. Uh, he confirms what my understanding was, that there's really no intention on the part of Fall River to ever use Stafford, the waters of the Stafford Pond, which he says they own, uh, for uh, drinking water. That was never the intent, and that was my understanding as well. The intent of Stafford Pond was simply to serve the mills. It had no other intention. The water of Stafford Pond does not go into North Watupper. It only goes into South Watupper. And as Mr. Fryer told me, uh, the course would be absolutely prohibitive to try to get the water from Stafford Pond to North Watupper. Uh, but in addition to that, with the loss of population in Fall River, and the loss of commercial development along the Quickershan River, it is most unlikely that Fall River will ever need the water of the Stafford Ponds. 
However, he did tell me, and he wanted to make this emphatic, that Fall River will do whatever is necessary to protect the uh, water quality of Stafford Pond uh, because they have a legal ownership of that water. Now, if you want to talk to Mr. Fryer, uh, Andy, mm -hmm. uh, he'll, he'd love to talk to you uh, uh, about what Fall River's position is on the pond. And, and what is his connection as opposed to Terry Sullivan, who's director of water and sewer for the city of Fall River? Is he I, under him or over him or? I assume he's over him, but uh, right. don't, don't hold me to that. I mean, all, all right. I made was one phone call uh, to confirm what my, my understanding had been as to the ownership of the water rights. Uh, all, all, all John was doing was confirming his understanding and my understanding that this goes back to the old mill days. Right. Uh, the Stafford Pond waters were purchased for the sole purpose of serving the Quickershan River Mills. Mm -hmm. uh, but but he, he was absolutely emphatic, he says, but my position is that we will do whatever is necessary to protect our interest in that water quality. Right. And that's how I left the conversation. Yeah, I mean, they may regard this as a secondary or tertiary water supply. They have North mm -hmm. Watupa as their primary reservoir. That's right. And they do not allow any boating at all on that. That's they right. allow yeah. fishing from the shore, yeah. but that's the extent of it. Mm -hmm. um, they do allow limited um, in South Watupa because it's not really connected to North right. Watupa now with the, with the highway. Um, he saw, uh, and again, this is a Mr. Sullivan from Fall River. He said they regularly get requests um, to open it up to boating, um, and people tell them, but it's allowed on Stafford Pond, so why won't you allow it here? Mm -hmm. yeah. so well, actually, Mr. That, that's part of what we're uh, planning on exploring. For whatever this is worth, Mr. Fryer's position was uh, that Stone Bridge has an obligation to notify us if they have any concern. He was most emphatic mm -hmm. about that as well. Right. well we that they lease, not that they we sell the water to Stone Bridge. So their position is that Stone Bridge should monitor that water on their behalf okay. and notify them of any concerns. So it sounds like this is someone else that we might want to invite yeah, it, to that meeting in Providence yeah. with, yeah. Uh, with DEM and right. DOH. Um, I'll, get, I'll get his phone number for you and, and add him to the list of contacts here. Okay. Andy, wasn't there a similar issue in Johnston with a pond that, to figure out who owned it? Because the waters, again, were controlled by DEM and then the dam broke and then once the water flew out, then they, the people who own the, the bottom of the pond? Right. Um, well, I, I'm not sure about Johnston, but there was the, the Boroughville case mm -hmm. um, with actually uh, Vinny Mesalella who owned the pond and was lowering the dam and the water level was too low and they were in an argument and basically um, the court again determined there's two separate sets of rights one are your rights underneath the the pond and one are the water rights and they can be separated from one another and in that case they they determined that the water rights including the right to use a launching ramp had been used far enough in time by the public that they had adverse possession to those water rights so um, here, they, here there's no that way, you right. know, Stonebridge mm -hmm. is getting them under contract, um, but they are two separate sets of rights that can be split apart. Part? Uh, just President, if I may. Sure. Uh, Tom Ramitowski, Chairman of the Conservation Commission. I, I just wonder if we also need to be a bit concerned that Fall River and our water systems are interconnected because being a North uh, Tiverton Fire resident mm -hmm. where we get our water right. we're told some of it comes from fall river so obviously the pipes mm -hmm. can go back and forth so if uh, this pond can be a source for half of our water it can also be a source for fall river and they should be pretty concerned about what's going on there the other thing is i've been looking into the airport issue and it turns out there are two federally recognized airports in tiverton one of them being the pond in another one, there's apparently some other grassy field airport a little bit to the north of the pond, north and west. But they have official <laughs> FAA numbers. And I'm wondering, since we're looking into the legal side of this, that's certainly an activity that I don't think we want on our reservoirs. And can we ask the council through you or through the administrator to also look into what does it take to ask the entities involved to just disallow that use from now on that we don't really need it? And I would say that. Uh, my research also shows that South Watupa Pond is a seaplane, it's a, a federally recognized right. seaplane landing area as well, so you really can't say we don't have one in this area. 
uh, that someone can land on, and we certainly shouldn't be doing that type of an activity uh, where we drink. And then finally, at our last meeting, we did have some people from the neighborhood. There's a neighborhood organization that's coming back up and trying to work on this issue. They're very, very concerned about the number of people that participate in these tournaments using very big boats at all different times during the day and the night, and also that there's no facilities for these people really whatsoever once they're out on the pond, and that that could be contributing to the pollution and the problems that we may be having there. They also indicated that there may be some homes uh, that don't have acceptable septic systems still, and we need, we as a town at least can pursue that to make sure that uh, we're doing whatever we can to make sure these substandard systems that may empty into the pond or be problematic that way are actually really being fixed and we're not just uh, you know aware of them but we're actually actively trying to fix them okay. thank right. you thank you obviously when uh, mr. tights is doing his investigation regarding all the rules and regulations that they'll take those uh, under consideration we'll, we'll, we'll look a bit we'll look into the FAA issues as well <laughs> Andy, are you going to coordinate? I like I like that idea of uh, you know multi-party meeting. There, are you going to? Um, eventually, I mean, okay. I think the next step would be a report back, and I think to see what happens from you know tomorrow night's meeting and the thing. Um, but I will have I'll try to lay out a plan, a game plan, and I will coordinate it going forward. Sure. So I just have I just have one final question. Part of my initial request was to get. A better sense of what the actual water quality data is and I'm just curious to what extent this might be a imminent health threat I don't know what the current you know water quality data says so you know if it's really bad then perhaps that lights a fire under these activities but mr. Romatowski I don't do you know What we normally get from the water districts is uh, a composite because not all the water comes from the pond that we get. So it's a mixture, and I think it's after they treat it as well. So we get uh, regular feedback from them about the quality of the drinking water, but it's not the water in the pond. Now, you or I may have, right, you or I may have a monitoring program there. I'm not sure. We'll have to check into that. They do monitor the conditions of some ponds. And there may be some data taken by Stone Bridge down around where their intake pipe is but we need to check in on that okay. thank you, thank you. Any, anything further thank you okay. All right. town administrator sale of nonquit school as you may recall at the uh, last council meeting I provided you with five uh, quotations to purchase the property uh, and as a result of your review, you instructed me to begin negotiations with the highest bidder. I did do that, and you have the results of that in the PNS that you've been issued in your packet. That PNS has been reviewed by the prospective buyer and has accepted it and will once the uh, the council approves the uh, buyer will have 30 days to perform due diligence on their part and will be able to determine whether they wish to go forward with it or not uh, we have a we have two checks or copies of two checks that uh, uh, for the deposit totaling five percent which was what required and uh, now are there any questions for the uh, regarding this actually just one comment there is a, a typo on item eight in the taxes and adjustments there's a few typos, there's a few typos. All right. it's also a typo on page on if it's uh, supposed to be a quote or a uh, no it's actually just a date number five there, there should be. It was left on your table, a red line copy. Yeah, that, that is the red, red line. Copy. Oh, line the red. okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. That was their request, um, but they didn't pick it up. So we have another <coughs> thousand years to keep using the property. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> Jim, I just think it's uh, I think it's just uh, an important point of clarification that while um, the amount of the bid was an important consideration, there were also other factors um, such as what might be a subject to conforming use of right. the property, use. nothing that would require variances or Correct. anything like that. And also the fact that this was not contingent upon any sort of financing, whether it be mortgage or grants or anything like that. Why did we waive the 10 day? They, they, what, what, what they had requested was 30 days okay. due diligence period. Um, state law as of January 1st now allows everybody a 10 day period. So we have agreed to extend it to 30 days. If, if, you, if, you, if you agree to it tonight, that will go till um, February, um, February 14th to do their due diligence. Um, and then closing would be on February 28th. Um, <coughs> and the other things they requested were the change you saw about you know, confirming that we're not using it, which we're not using it now, and anything that's in there in personal property is theirs except for the little heater and humidifier. Mm -hmm. And then the final thing was they asked about uh, some sort of zoning. So we're, we'll provide them with a zoning certificate that says that it's a permitted use for a single family residence. Do we have any items in there? <coughs> or is it pretty yeah. much empty? There's, a, the there's an old desk and, you know, some stuff that the school department left. Uh, nothing. Artifacts. Nothing that uh, <laughs> we would be interested in. Uh -huh. I, I did. I did. I did check with the town administrator before I agreed to it. I had that same question: Is, is there anything in there that we? I'm leaving a one of a kind desk. That's probably worth a million dollars. No. I'm <laughs> okay. Any other questions? I do have a question. Go ahead. And I'm, as soon as I can find it, I'll ask it. The, qu the question I had was, we have come to an arrangement on how the property is going to be um, assessed for real estate taxes. And the only thing I, that, that occurred to me um, is, first of all, obviously, we're, we're doing, we have the authority to do that because you didn't tell us we don't, <laughs> presumably. <laughs> um, and second of all, I wonder if this is, and I'll tell you, the only reason I'm thinking about this is because I've been in Massachusetts appellate tax court for the past week with a client, and I am now an expert in all matters <laughs> relating <laughs> to taxes um, from sitting in the audience. The, does this set some sort of methodology going forward that is not currently rec a recognized methodology for setting initial tax rates in, any, in, a, in a fiscal year? Um, no, I don't. I don't think it does. I mean, okay. to, to answer your first question, you, you clearly have the authority because you can always abate the taxes at any point to reflect what you've agreed to here. Um, and what you've agreed to is really, I think, just what's the actual normal methodology now. We're saying that the the price that's been paid, this has been established. It's an open market. We had multiple bids. This is the price that we received after that uh, from an unrelated <laughs> hand arm's length transaction. Therefore, this would make sense that this would be the value of the property, whatever someone was actually willing to pay it now. And then we're saying that we would, you know, only increase it by the the amount of the improvements that, that are put in over the next year. Now that might be a break because conceivably the, the, the value of the improvements plus the past one, there might be you know, a synergistic effect and it really be worth more, but we're only doing that for one year. Again, I think, I think that's probably what the tax assessor is likely to do anyway. Um, and then beyond that, now with Rhode Island having revals every three years, um, it really doesn't have any long-term effect. So I think we're just, we're taking what's the common methodology and would probably be used by the tax assessor anyway and setting it forth in the agreement so that they have some certainty. The, um, now how is this, uh, and just for the record, ahead. this exact same methodology I used with the sale of a surplus fire station in another town. Right. So when we talk about the value of the improvements, we're not talking, how are we measuring that in the next fiscal year? Are we going to be, um, 
the making a making a, a, a based on the permits, isn't it? Yeah, well, it'll be based on the permits and it'll also be based on the inspection by the assessor. Okay. And if the assessor has questions and says, yeah, you know, boy, you, you've done a half a million dollars worth of improvements in the last year, um, then we would, and they say, no, I have it, then, you know, then, well, provide me with receipts. the receipts okay. and tell me what you've done, show me what you've done and not done, um, which is what we would do with anybody. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just so, want to know how it works. Um, and it also provides a basis. I mean, I hope it wouldn't come to it, but it also provides a basis so that if there is a disagreement and an appeal, there is a basis to deal with the appeal. What would you know, I, the improvements? I would be asking some of these questions to the assessor. I know he's not here, so I'm <laughs> loading them on you, Andy. But okay. um, maybe in future we at least have these um, questions ready for the professional who's going to be administering them in the future but otherwise I just have I just have one last question is there any kind of legal recourse in the initial proposal there was talk of um, uh, keeping the cultural aspect of the school as part of the the proposal is there is there any recourse for us to kind of make sure that actually transpires, or is that solely at the discretion of the of the bidder? Well, based on the agreement that you have before you, it will be at the discretion of the buyer. Mm -hmm. They've said what their intent is, but you're not putting a restriction on it. Okay. I mean, you could if you want, but that obviously would further negatively impact value. Sure. Sure. It makes Excuse sense. me. I have one question. How much w will the sale price? How much will this? Okay, Mrs. Pelletier, it's it's not an open meeting. We'll, we will give the price out. Okay. okay. I hope it's worth it to the town. Yep. Okay. Anything further from the council? Before we accept the agreement, the typos will be fixed. Yes. Yes. The 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 typos on the red line are just because of different. Most well, there are some the that are not as well. Okay. Like in line item 8, the tax adjustments, it says, you know, for the first year, it is what it is for the price. And the following year, it says any additional improvements, yada, yada, yada. And it says December 31st, 2012. I probably should read 2013. Right. Okay. Thank you. And it will definitely be fixed now that we know <laughs> where it is. I'm sure, Mr. Tights, before we actually execute this document, you'll go through it to make sure that all typos are corrected. So this is going to have a different date on it anyway. Right. This, this was done rather quickly on Friday when going back and forth. You're, so all of these strange ampersands and... Yeah, that is due... Signs. Yeah. All, all those are due to just the fact that Mr. Gonslow's version of Microsoft Word does not like my version of like Microsoft Word. Mm -hmm. So wherever I had quotation marks or an apostrophe, it decided to put yeah. some sort of weird symbol in. In the initial agreement, I went through and fixed all those. But, uh, with all the changes, they got lost again. Okay. There will be nothing further. Um, I will uh, entertain a motion regarding the sale of uh, an unquit property. The sum in question is... I want to make sure it's the total number. Yeah, $101,000. Uh, I move that we authorize the purchase and sale or have, is that the right, is that right, what, what, authorize the purchase and sale agreement? Authorize the, the execution, execution of the, of the, the purchase and sale agre agreement by the town administrator for uh, the um, non quit school uh, to Cynthia R. Hansen, as indicated by our purchase and sale agreement exhibit I don't know, E to B. Um, what else? May, you, would you like? Yes, could you just, while we're at it, we'll save, save the trouble and further authorize the execution of the purchase and sale agreement and the documents effectuating the sale itself by the town administrator? 
Okay. Could you? Do you have okay. that, Nancy? Mm -hmm. That way we can have him sign all the closing documents. Yeah. Okay. Execute and authorize the purchase of sale by town administrator for Knockwood School to C.R. Hansen as indicated by purchase of sale agreement E to B and to effectuate the sale itself by the town right. administrator. But, but that line would go in right with, right yeah. after signing the purchase and sale agreement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can yeah. execute the binder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Do we have a second? Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. Financial business. This was from Councillor De Medeiros, review of proposed 2013-14 budget. Uh, Councillor De Medeiros is not here this evening, uh, so uh, I guess we can uh, postpone that. Please request that it on every um, agenda. Yeah. Okay. And this, uh, the mm. budget that's attached here simply has the uh, recommendations of the council at this point. I'm not sure if anyone noticed this, but the, in my copy, I think there's some pages missing. I seem to be missing a lot of the even pages. Oh, you didn't get the... I don't uh, have the even pages either. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of information uh, missing out of the... Apparently when it was, we're printing everything two-sided. Yeah, and you somebody you didn't hit the two-sided, I bet. Or didn't press the two-sided two button on the copy. Yeah. yeah. Learning yeah. curve. This budget That's is... All. Nancy, our budget has only got odd pages. You want to look like pages on your book? Odd, Odd pages. pages. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have the odd pages? <laughs> 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 oh, I'm sorry. Mine has all the pages. <laughs> I will email it to you in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, take, you take mine. Right. Well, I don't preferential treatment. Okay. That's a very odd budget you Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did anyone else only have the odd pages? We all did. Oh, for goodness <laughs> sakes. Probably means it's going to be. I'll email out. <laughs> I just want to see the other people. That'd be good. So it means the even pages we can cut right out of the budget. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Let's, let me see where the town administrator's budget is. <laughs> I think that was one of the even pages. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, I don't, I don't know if this is, tell me if this is, did we reach any consensus on when we would be having the one-on-one? -on -one? Oh, actually, I was going to bring that up on the council of comments oh. and so forth. Okay, great. Yep. Thank you. The what? Yeah, the, the meeting with the budget committee. Oh, we're trying to schedule. Um, you're it was the you 17th or the 24th. It was uh, two dates. Has he, have you sent this to the budget committee already? No. You'll do it t tomorrow? I will be, yes. Okay, anything else under the uh, proposed budget? I'm sure we'll get another copy through our email. Okay, hey, new business. Philomena Santos Higgins, Development Director of Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, requests council authorization for, 60, for 62 and 25 mile bike ride in East Bay on Saturday, September 28, 2013, from 7.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. to start and finish at Sakonet Vineyards. Please, Chief uh, Bakley's uh, recommendation. Good evening. Good evening. We had a very successful event last year. Could um, you move the mic down? <laughs> Thank excuse you. Me. We had a very successful event last year. It was the first time in the area, and we raised over $52,000 uh, for a first-time event. So that was, um, we we're very, very pleased with it. Uh, we had uh, 90 cyclists who participated in the event. 
and we are contemplating between 150 to 200 cyclists to participate this year. Wow. Um, and it is for September 28th at the same facility uh, at Sakana Vineyards with um, and the same route as last year. And we ask for your permission to uh, conduct the event again this year. Great. Yeah. Uh, obviously, uh, it's a worthwhile cause, and I see Chief ba Blakely has uh, uh, given his uh, blessing, so to speak, as long as that you have a, a police officer yep. uh, to, to do that. So, yes. Chief, is there anything you want to add to that? Thank you. It, it was a successful event last year. There were no problems, and she didn't play a police officer. I don't foresee any problems in the future. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Okay. Hey, uh, Ms. Higgins, uh, I think that, uh, um, just speaking for myself, I think it's worthwhile and, and I think it's something that uh, no, not only enhances uh, the towns of uh, Tiverton and Little Compton, but I think it, it shows our concern for cystic fibrosis. And we appreciate that from the council very much okay. and the community at large. So our I aim will, is uh, to find a cure for cystic fibrosis so yes. that children can have hope. So. Absolutely. Thank okay, you. I will uh, entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to uh, approve authorization for the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation for a 62 and 25 mile bicycle ride in East Bay on Saturday, September 28th, 2013 from 7.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, with a start and finish at Siconet Vineyards. We have a motion. Second. And a second. All those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. <coughs> Belli, Jeffrey Belli, Solution to Abuse of the Pay-As-You-Throw Free Bag Program. Thank you, Council. Uh, as you all know, my name is Jeffrey Belli. I live at 2 Park Street here in Tiverton. I'm not going to take up much of your time. Um, I just wanted to bring to the council's attention uh, a small problem. It seems that some of the residents in this town that are on the free bag program have found ways to abuse the program. One of the ways, as you've probably seen, that I did pass out to some council members and I did give it to Mrs. Mello to pass out to the rest of you tonight, that uh, some people have found ways to uh, turn the bags back in, or turn the bags into the vendors trying to get money for them. There have been other instances, uh, one that I had learned uh, this past Monday, not today, prior Monday, from Mr. Gonsolo, is we do have a single couple, both of them have receiving their own free bags when they are living in the same apartment. Um, this is just one small instance of abuse. Um, there have been past ones put out in the Newport Daily News, people showing up in ex expensive vehicles to pick up their bags. You know, if we solve this problem, we're going to have another problem in the, f in the future because they're just going to find another way to abuse the program. I do realize that there are honest, law-abiding citizens out there that are, are on the program that would be affected by this, but it seems out of all the communities that offer the pay as you throw program. Back in 2010, when I was running for town council and the pay as you throw program was not implemented yet, I spoke with the gentleman in Middletown, the town administrator, Sean Brown, and I had specifically asked him if that was something Middletown would ever offer. And he came right out and said blatantly, no. He said, I would never offer that program because in this town, as well as many others, people will find a way to abuse the program. I feel, as a taxpayer, a person who buys bags, I've been living in this town um, for going on four years now. You know, I've been abiding by the law. You know, I buy the bags. I feel that, you know, this is, because of the abuse, I feel this is a program that we can no longer afford. The money we're spending on giving these people the free bags, we have a roof in this, you know, in the in the town on a municipal building that needs to be redone. You know, we have many other things that the money could go for. I feel that 
you know, the, our only solution is to stop the program. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll just say that, I mean, it's unfortunate, but anytime you have any type of program, uh, there are people who are going to try to scam it. Uh, I personally believe that uh, the program, uh, you know, probably needs to be tightened up in some areas, but there are people in town, and even though people don't want to admit it, there are people in town who do need this type of assistance. Uh, we've tried to put some uh, measures in to uh, eliminate any, anybody trying to scam, but where there's a will, there's a way. Correct. And, you know, and I thank you for bringing this forward. It's, it's something I'm sure that we're aware of and we're trying to look at to uh, minimize it as much as possible. Uh, but again, you know, it, it's unfortunate that uh, it doesn't matter what type of program you have because there are people who will lie about what their, their properties are worth. They'll come in and fight to say that they don't have a 300 or 400 or $500,000 property. Uh, so, I mean, so, and, uh, and there are people who drive in Mercedes who come and get their free bags. Uh, I deal in public housing and I see it every day when they drive in in their Mercedes and and they're there for their, you know, their, their housing voucher and so forth. But again, those are things that you have to take into consideration uh, as to what is the overall good the program does. And, uh, you know, so I think that's, that's what we have to look at. I'm sure between DPW and, and the town administrator, they're, they're aware of it. And, uh, you know, we'll be looking at it to see what, you know, steps we can take to try to minimize it. Thank you for your time. Uh, Mr. President, if I can just respond briefly. Uh, Mr. Bellucci at DPW tells me that to avoid the problem of bags being returned for a refund, uh, all of the stores are being advised that the bags can now be returned only at DPW. So that should avoid that problem. But, but I just wanted to make one other comment. The newspaper article that, that's behind, I'm sure you're concerned, Mr. Belli, uh, points out that the people that who have been returning these bags are young people. That's all it says. And, and I, I really, I think we may be pushing it to try to suggest that it's necessarily poor people who get free bags who are pulling a scam. I don't believe that for a moment, and I don't think that we have any evidence that those are the people who were pulling the scam. If I, if I may it says young people. Yeah. I wonder how many parents might be missing yeah, their right. bags. That, that I suspect is what's <laughs> happening. <laughs> uh, th thank you, Mr. President. Just thank quick an anecdotally, Mr. Gonsalo, do you, do you happen to know off the top of your head, like, how many people, like, can we quantify how many people are on the special? About 250. 250. Which is half of what it was last Half of what it was the previous year. Yeah. Because we started to uh, require tax returns, the first page of your tax return. Um, so that cut it. That cut it in half. So we are. We are. We are. Oh yeah, absolutely. And in, in the to monitor. The okay. In the just if off the top of your head, do you remember what the last quarter's worth of receipts were? No. Uh, all I'm trying to say is that the receipts were getting far surpassed the. 250, even if all 250 people were scamming, which it doesn't sound like they are, but just to really try to quantify the issue. And I think it's worth pursuing, but just I don't think we have to throw the whole program out I know, because I don't of think this. So either. Um, you know, especially since we don't, and I'm perfectly happy to, to look at it harder, um, we don't have any quantifiable quantifiable data that aside from anecdotal evidence in the newspaper, um, I'm certainly not inclined to make any policy decisions based upon, you know, an allusion to youths returning bags, but an unknown quantity and an unknown number of youths. You know, I mean, it's, it's a little bit... I'm happy, like I said, I'm happy to look into it more and have if we can get an, uh, an actual statement of what what we're experiencing, um, you know, maybe we do have some tweaks to make. But I think overall, the program is is functioning as it is int was intended to do, and that is to provide the folks who need um, a bit of assistance with the bag uh, program that assistance, in in such a way that does not make it uh, an overly arduous process or 
uh, a humiliating process or a shameful process, which is m far more often the case in um, in social programs and other types of assistance programs. Um, we've done such this in a discreet way that has been fairly successful uh, as a whole, and I think um, simple changes as you know, you just take them out of the plastic bag with the paper in it, then you can't return them to the store. If and if we see that that the the trend continues, that people are trying to return them to the store, then we know we have a different problem, um, or rather, the parents have different <laughs> <laughs> have a different problem. Um, but I think I think as far as the returns, that we've solved that problem. The uh, DPW director has contacted all of those who we have listed as selling the bags and has indicated that they should not accept any return bags. I mean, I can't, I can't imagine an instance where that would be necessary, but I suppose if it, if it were absolutely necessary, then, well, then if you someone can if contact some, us um, if someone, here in the town. you know, lived in Tiverton and bought bags and then moved to Fall River and no longer needs the bags, Give them to a neighbor. And, and <laughs> you can certainly understand in a situation like that where they would try to get a refund. But that won't happen. But I can't imagine that's happening on a weekly basis. People are fleeing the town and with the stockpiles <laughs> of trash bags. <laughs> no, and, and to what extent they're being returned, I have no idea. Yeah. Or we're being returned. It may be isolated. Well, I think it'd definitely be interesting to see now that you have to return to the DPW, whether that number of, you know, those number of returns reduce drastically. I mean, Jim, if you can, if you can just call the, the is it Shaw's in the city and, a, and ask them, who, what was the, ca you know, are we talking about teenagers here or are we talking about, I mean. It, it I don't know if they'd remember. I can try. I mean, that, and that, that might put some, at least some ease to the minds of people who feel that the system is perhaps being abused. Is there any recourse to possibly putting a fine for anyone caught legitimately trying to abuse the program? We already threatened they them pay for with back. We have that already? Uh, well, for legal uh, action. Yeah, because uh, <laughs> they sign an affidavit. They're state, <laughs> so it's perjury. All right. Well, so it was a way to yeah. possibly give them a $50 fine or something. Because I wouldn't support, uh, obviously, taking that away from someone to actually use them. Because we had a gentleman email me who, whose mother lives in town, who's in her 80s, who's part of the free bags program. I, I wouldn't want to punish that oh, person, definitely. Yeah. So. Okay. They signed a document that indicates that they're signing under penalties of perjury. Yeah, they signed an affidavit that says, I, am, I qualify and I am not lying to you. And if so... If I mean, we, we, we are sending some sets, threatening letters to some people, and I mean, if we, if we actually have proof of it, then we'll prosecute them for fraud or perjury. But so far, we haven't even gotten to that point yet. And, and, hopefully and it's we'll only one possible one that we've even identified as heading in that direction. I mean, and, and, and we've had just the... And we don't know the d we don't know the underlying data behind why we had 265 this year and 480 last year. It it you know I ho I hate to think that there is we have disenfranchised people, um, but I don't think that's the case. I think it's that um, if you were perhaps on the fence as to whether or not you you're trying to stretch the line a little, um, that. Re requirement for your first the first page of your federal tax return made that a little bit harder to do anything further Councilor Ruda uh, thank you mr. president <coughs> basically I've had uh, quite a few discussions with some residents in town and they continually will ask me <coughs> you know geez you happen to know what what's going on with the uh, day-to-day -day goings with the harbor master or the what's going on in the police department what's going on in the fire department and I believe um, in the past this I think this was a, a practice where the department heads would give a sort of a public status report what goes on uh, in their departments uh, to the council in 
at the town council at the town council meeting. I'll make it first clear that I'm not asking the, the department heads to give a full report to the town council, be it that as though I know there probably be private information within the report. I'm just basically asking for a, a small synopsis of what's going on in the department and possibly maybe add maybe an announcement. The police chief might make an announcement, oh, you know, we've had a number of break-ins in this area. We want to remind residents, uh, lock your doors, so on and so forth. And it might be beneficial for some visibility of what's actually going on in the apartments in the town. And I just want to ask um, if anyone else think this would be a, I think personally it's a good idea. A lot of people uh, I've talked to like think it's a good idea. I'd like to actually see who the hub master is and hear from him what uh, he does possibly like oh, I took so many applications for mooring so on and so forth and I'd like to actually uh, see what you think uh, members of the town council about that um, I, I think in the past we, we might have from time to time gotten updates from the uh, department heads but again that's under the town administrator's purview it's really up to him we do get reports from the town administrator and we do get uh, some information and and some of them come before us from time to time from you know different issues and so forth uh, again I think that would be something that would, uh, if Mr. Gonsolo you know wants that under his purview to you know have them come in just to give a, a once maybe quarterly I think once a month you know is it, the, uh, is this the yeah, you know, discussion uh, piece yeah. well uh, I, I don't have an issue with uh, the department head reports to myself and the council being public as a matter of fact, I have several copies here of just the department head reports exclusive of mine because mine goes to the council mm -hmm. and there is information in there from time to time that is confidential. So, I mean, I don't have a problem with taking the back part of, of my report to the council monthly and just publicizing it or putting it on the website. I think that, you know, when you, when you mentioned it, I thought we sort of get some of that now in our monthly reports from the administrator. They're monthly? Yes. Monthly. Yeah. But we get them in such a way because there's sensitive information in there that um, doesn't provide an open venue for... Yeah, and I'm not asking for the full report. No, 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 but I'm saying that that would be, you know, if there was two versions of that, you know, I could see how that could serve most, m much of that purpose is, you know, you leave the confidential stuff to the way it's done now and, and, and the other things that are of good public knowledge um, could be presented at a, at a council meeting like we are right now and that would give us the opportunity to d discuss it amongst ourselves and inform the public and typically we do have department heads, most of them anyway, uh, here um, from time to time to answer any questions or etc. I'm, you know, I'm happy to have mo all the information I can possibly swallow, so. And this is not, not for our benefit, I'm more thinking for the residents of the town. I, I think it's Because, you know, we get the report, they don't see that. Yeah, I think it's for our benefit as well, though, because we're informed by, you know, uh, oh, well, yeah, the exactly discussion. Right. Yeah. But also, exactly. you know, I mean, I religiously read every single minute of every board and commission, so I am very well informed. <laughs> um, but not everybody has the opportunity to do that, or the where, you know, the the reading time. No, I'm kidding. I don't really. But um, you know, all of that stuff is, and we get to the pro the problem of all that stuff is somewhere. You just got to dig through it sometimes to find it. And I think if it's condensed all into one easy to swallow packet, all the important bits, all the current bits, and we can talk about it to boot, I'm perfectly happy entertaining such an item. Yeah, I think if you just give us the copy of the department reports, you know, without any sensitive, uh, you know, stuff, and maybe quarterly have them, you know, present their own. Yeah, we're gonna, again, that's up to you, Jim. You know, they, they report to you. But again, just it's, it's really basically more information, not only for the council, but again, for, for the town to, to know what's going on, so to speak. You know, as, as we know, those of us who on the council have been here for a while, we know what rumor does. And when uh, they think they've heard something going on in a department and so forth, and uh, 
you know, it just grows and grows and grows. Then finally, when we get to it, they're like, that's not true. Well, nobody came out and told them that wasn't true, you know, so. I think the, so that it might be beneficial that way also. Well, I can, I can leave these reports on the table here this evening. If the council so desires, I can put it on a website. Uh, and then your report's in my office. That you, know, you can again, pick up during right, executive yeah. session. Right. And again, as I said, you know, they, they report to you. So it is, it is you know, within your purview and your responsibility to, uh, number one, get those reports to us and if you see fit to have them come before the council. Okay. I just have uh, one question on that. Did, did any department heads show any, um, um, you know, angst about giving possibly a daily, daily status, like a, not daily status, but a little status report? Do you have any discussions with the department heads about uh, possibly giving a report publicly? Have I had discussions? Mm. No. But you know me that you did. I'm sorry? But you emailed me that you did. No, I, our discussion was that we would issue, that I think we could issue department reports so that they, uh, that everybody could know what was going on within the departments. But I received an email saying that you discussed with department heads about giving a report and some of them were a little uh, reluctant to do so based on private information. Sorry, don't recall that. If, if I did, I'll look back at my emails and... I think all of them have come in front of us at one point or another. Yeah. On the last meeting uh, Monday, whenever we had a question about, uh, especially when we were talking about the budget, we always been referred to the department head. So, it could be good if there was a, in the report, if we did have a small question, they possibly would be there to answer them quickly, so. Yeah, I, you know. At any time, you know, we've, we've had something pertaining to a particular department head, it's always a good idea to give them a heads up that we're gonna talk about it. And Jim typically does that on our, at our request. If, if I know something's gonna come up, you know, relating to something, I think it might be advisable to have the tax assessor there or something. That's always a good heads up to them. And, and usually if there's something, you know, going on, uh, they usually hear for that particular thing. On a normal course of events, some of them are here, but not all of them come to every single council meeting, you know. Uh, and again, I mean, if, if we're getting the information from Jim, if there's something specific, once we read the report, we can always request through Jim, you know, if they're available, if he cannot provide us with the answer. Because again, he is, he is the town administrator, and he should be the one giving us all the information. Anything else? I'm sorry, was there a result? Is there a, uh, are we doing it? Are we not doing it? Well, uh, right now, Jim is going to provide us with the department heads. Okay. Individual reports instead of the total monthly one that we get. Uh, and again, unless there is something specific that we see, I mean, I don't see any need to have every department head here, you know, once a month because, again, it may be stuff that's moot nothing's really like it doesn't have to be once a month I mean right. the quarterly is yeah. you know, I think it's fine again, so that is that is up to Jim because again they work for Jim you know understood you know I mean we can request through Jim you know I, th I think if we looked at something if something was coming up with just for argument's sake in the planning board well then we may request somebody from the planning department to be here to answer some questions that Jim may not be able to answer and whether it be the police department or the, or the fire department, whatever those cases are, from time to time, you know, we, we may need that, like the tax assessor, you know. Uh, so I, I think in, in the normal course of events, I think as we see things, we can request it, and, and I'm sure Jim will be able to provide, you know, that for us. But I, I think overall, uh, if, if Jim cannot get the answer, he normally can, you know, get it for us, you know. And I think as far as updates are concerned, if we're getting the, the monthly ones, uh, they can be published, we can discuss them. You know, that's, that's basically it. I mean, you know, other to, than to say there, you know, well, the DPW is looking at, you know, moving a tree. I mean. I mean, not something. Yeah. I'm not no, talking about I'm just, you know, things that trivial. Yeah. But you know, like things like uh, the police department. Oh, we've had so many calls mm -hmm. for this. We had so many calls for that. Same thing for the fire department. They can give status calls, uh, calls on, you know, how many calls a month they get. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, I think it'd be beneficial for not only us, but also residents of the town to get that information publicly. That is in these department reports that I have here. Okay. 
that, uh, you know, here we go. I can leave them on the council table mm -hmm. or on the table here for people to pick up. I can put it on the website, what, whatever the council desires. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, bids and requests for proposals. Town Administrator. At some point in time, previous council uh, authorized the harbor master to go out and seek bids for a pump out boat. We did that. We have the bids. I have them attached. And now the council needs to authorize the purchase of the boat. And uh, with just some, hopefully you've all read the agreement. The council should be aware of the fact that there is an amount in the next year's budget for this program and that it is a budget of $13,871 with estimated revenue of $3,500. So it would be a projected loss of $10,371 and it would be at minimum a 10-year program because once we accept this grant, we're obligated to conduct this activity for 10 years. Additionally, uh, the boat that was chosen is the Bay Sales Marine Incorporated and it's the 21-foot boat with a 275-gallon holding tank. And that would be at a cost of $53,665. Our match would be $13,416, which we don't have budgeted. Uh, so the grant amount would be $40,249. <coughs> Questions? I have, a, I have a question. At the surface, this appears to be a math problem in terms of um, funding the initial match of the boat and then the fact that it's a net loss every year for at least 10 years. But I certainly don't want to make a judgment based solely on numbers. So uh, my question is, I have two questions. First, are there any, I don't know the first thing about pump out boats, nor owning a boat, being on the water and requiring the services of a pump out boat, but have we historic, has there been historically an issue with boaters in Tiverton Waters dumping sewerage? I it, is it? That, okay, Mr. Veneer is here from. You know, the so Hubba Master is here. Oh, Bruce is here. I'm sorry, I didn't see Bruce over there. I'd like to understand the environmental mm -hmm. impact of not having the boat, and then I have a couple other yeah. questions. Hmm? Good evening, Council Members. Uh, I'm Dave Vanya, I'm the Harbor Master. This is Bruce Cox, uh, Chair of the Harbor Commission. To answer your questions, um, Rhode Island is one of the few states in the country that is the entire country, the whole entire state is a no dumping zone. Um, within your Harbor Management Plan, which is a document you've probably not seen as a freshman um, council person, is a exhibit stating that we will be acquiring a pump out boat. To explain to you the importance of this particular document, um, you have um, 
in your income stream mooring fees that come into the town to the tune of it's around $55,000 $55, um, on an operational budget of less than about $20,000, $22,000. Uh, yeah, we're, we're and 21. 20, and in order to retain that income stream, you need to have an approved harbor management plan. The harbor commission had had spent basically two and a half, three years exhaustively reviewing and, and approving a, and getting an approved harbor management plan in place. Part and parcel of that harbor management plan, that plan is approved by CRMC, Coastal Resource Management Council. The sister agency of the uh, CRMC is DEM. DEM is a water quality arm of the state. It's, uh, CRMC is the water usage arm of the state. They do work somewhat in concert. Within the harbor management plan is an obligation for a water quality certificate. In order to charge for your mooring fees, you need to have a harbor management plan. In order to have a harbor management plan, you need a water quality certificate. In order to get a water quality certificate from Joseph Migliori at DEM, you better have a pump-out boat. It's that simple. So while the pump-out boat does have operational costs associated, associated with it, it also has an income stream associated with it. <coughs> now, from an ecological perspective, um, I moved here, I bought my house here, in 2006, moving here in 2007 after renovating it. And um, one of the things that drew me to Tiburon is the fact, uh, and I've been on the water virtually all my life, um, was the fact that in watching the water closures that occurred across the bay, across the state, the Connor River never closed. Um, north end it might, but nothing south of the bridge. Um, we had a water closure down at Fogland this summer. Uh, our own success is killing us in some regards. What we're talking about is species in the water and E. coli bacteria in the water reached a point where fog land was closed for a significant period of time. That's closed to um, shell fishing. Uh, it's not hard to imagine, gee, if it's not good for the shellfish, it's probably not good for the humans. And while there's a theoretical, theoretical washout period, I personally don't like to even think about that. Um, so this is a program, the boat that's actually budgeted there is the least expensive of the vessels. Uh, we tried to stay in Rhode Island candidly and the highest vessel you see on there was a Rhode Island boat, unfortunately. Um, in terms of the budgeting for this, uh, one of the assets that this town sold this year uh, was Marine One, which is a Harbor Master's former boat for slightly more than $4,000. So the net requirement of funding this year is a little bit more than $8,000. Um, if this vessel is not purchased this year, um, candidly, what I have to tell CRMC, listen, that exhibit within our harbor management plan is no longer there. It's out. Whether or not it comes back in, I don't know. How long will it take these, this process to go through again? I don't know. Uh, we do have an approved grant from the, from the state at this point. It was, you know, we went out, we solicited the grant, we were given authority, we received it in August. Um, I would strongly encourage and I appreciate the fact that you were just looking at the numbers and you said, I'm ignorant of this. You're not a stupid person, you're ignorant of it. And that's what our job is to advise you and educate you um, about what the water is all about. I mean, uh, Tiverton has among the longest shoreline in the state. Um, it has a very active um, uh, boating community. We've tried to tailor our budget looking at not just saying every morning we'll pay X dollars. We try to tailor it so that the vessels that are going to be using that service will be paying for that service. Um, so, in, in a nutshell, this is something the town needs. I mean, there are certain things that are required to run a town safely and efficiently. When we looked at this <coughs> as an item, um, we had originally thought, well, maybe we'll make each mooring owner in the town pay for this program because, after all, it's their moorings in town. But <clears throat> each of the moorings are different. Some people have a 19-foot sailboat, a little tiny sailboat. Uh, somebody might have a 16-foot work skiff. Um, all these different types of boats, and not all of them contain a head or a marine pump-out unit, so a marine sanitation device. So uh, what we decided <laughs> instead was to pay for service type of thing. Um, it's going to be slow at first. 
Um, the income stream will be minor at first, and it does cost us to dispose of it. That's why there's an expense involved in it. Um, there's an expense to operate the vessel, mm -hmm. of course, and we have to put personnel on the vessel. So you have to have somebody to operate the vessel. So uh, yes, it, it is a negative um, impact as far as that goes, but in the long haul, it's a good thing for the town. And have we had one before? No, we have no. not. So in the absence of one, <coughs> assuming someone just doesn't dump into the water, what's what do they do? <coughs> Presently, right now, uh, no. what happens is people <laughs> people either um, drive back to sea. The, the issue became uh, Standish Boat Yard presently is our only pump-out facility in town. Right now, the presently the only pump-out facility in town. Um, DEM's problem was it's so far from Fogland to the Tiverton Basin. Um, it was in excess of you know half to three quarters of a mile. They wanted to have something close by. If we would have a pump-out station on shore in Fogland, if we were to have a pump-out station. Um, in Nantaquocket Pond, then DEM would give us our water quality certificate without having this. But we don't have those facilities. We don't have that option. That's, uh, that's one of the reasons. From a practical perspective, um, the communities that have the most successful programs of, the, of this nature, Bristol being an example, have what is known as a remote pump out from a standpoint of while it's nice to say people would should go to a pump out facility, it's land based. Um, the most valuable time most of us have is our recreational time because it's the least amount of time we have. Um, and will people stay in line in order to use this pump out facility? Because it's an exercise. Uh, and the answer is in all reality, no. Um, a remote pump out provided by the boat is the most cost efficient way to operate it. It is literally a matter of you call the harbor master, you put a flag on the rail of your vessel, the flags are provided by DEM, and it is pumped out. There's a charge for each pump out. The person will buy chits, if you will, uh, not physical chits, but actually a listing, if you will, um, for the service, and that's how the execution will occur. We do have a substantial visitor vessel population that comes down to Fogland on any major weekend, and that is where, I speak from experience when I go to Block Island or Cuddyhunk or any other island or other destination harbor. If your head hap the, if your holding tank happens to be full, you have a problem on your hands. Um, some people will dispose of that problem improperly. If you don't have the means of getting rid of it, unfortunately it will get be gotten rid of. That's the problem. I just have a couple of questions. Um, you did mention that Fogland was closed uh, for a period of time. That is correct. And was, you, you mentioned that there was feces in the war. It was E. E. coli bacteria okay. uh, analysis. And so in, in the source of that is feces, whether it be human or, or animal. It could be birds. Um, it could be anything. There are okay. other sources. And, you know, the, the issue is not not necessarily, is this going to stop all problems? No, it's not. But, you know, humans are the only mammal that have taken to using a system of collection. And fortunately, that enables us to at least eliminate some percentage of the issue. Um, but there's no direct link to the issue? Uh, direct link of vessels and, and water quality? Yes, there is. It's just a function of... No, there's no direct link from the fog land closing to possibly people dumping into the water. It occurred during the highest use time period of the year. It occurred in the summertime. It didn't occur in the wintertime. It occurred when vessels were in the area. Well, also usually a cold that won't germinate in the wintertime either. That's true. That is true. But the, the, there, there is a rational connection between the utilization of pump-out facilities and a pump-out boat contrasted with just normal activity. Is there, an, was, I think it was, uh, that way I'm might have been cut from the budget by the budget committee? If I'm not mistaken, last year? Um, no, I don't think it was in the budget. Mm -hmm. No, no, it was taken out. It wasn't? Mm -hmm. Okay. It was no, the council didn't approve it, and the budget, budget committee didn't put it back in. Right. The yeah, it was not in the budget last year. And is, is there, what was the reasoning for that? I'm actually not privy to what the reasoning was for not putting it in. Well, you can ask us. Okay. Well, oh, why, why they didn't put it in? Why the, well, why the budget the time, did not put when, it in? When the grant came up, the budget process had already been done. No. 
Can I speak, please? No, not at this point well, in time. Mr. Roderick, not it's quite right. obvious not that you don't want to hear from the public because I you're trying to make a capital expenditure here. Mr. Souza, I said not at this time. We're still in the middle of a discussion. Well, he asked a question about the budget committee. I'd like to answer mm -hmm. it. Well, uh, we're, we're discussing it first, if you don't mind. <laughs> so when the grant came up, we, you know, took the advantage of having the grant, you know, and going forward with it. There, there were a couple of iterations of um, discussions about the pump out boat. There was some period where uh, the harbor master and um, the harbor commission thought we might be able to retrofit Marine One. There was a, uh, a, a gift on the table of a free set of tanks and equipment, mm -hmm. and we had to act, and we did not, and that expired, and we've no longer had that uh, opportunity. And I think that was, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that was right in the middle of, right at our, the budget cycle. Right at, in the middle of the budget cycle, right. and we sort of, we, we couldn't grapple the issue, and so that opportunity passed us, and I think at that time, I'm just speaking for for the reason I think we did not put it in our budget was we weren't buying a boat and ergo the the operational budget was at the at the time moot because we hadn't come to a um, conclusion as a council as to whether or not we were in fact going to even buy a boat um, or or get a boat or find a solution to this problem and I presume you know typically. Um, the, the budget committee, uh, you know, looks to us a bit for guidance on those policy-related issues, and if none is given, I, I don't, I don't think they, they take it incumbent upon themselves to, um, you know, create a line item when right. we hadn't purchased the boat or we hadn't given authorization to um, purchase a <coughs> purchase a boat. Okay. And then after that, then the the grant became available, and so that kind of put a little impetus in the council to to look at possibly buying the boat. And we, we went out to um, at least do some research. I don't know if we went out to bid on a used vessel, but part of this conversation when we were looking, before we were looking at this grant application process, we did sort of see what test the waters, if I may say, uh, what the, uh, a used vessel might cost us. Um, because they would match uh, a used vessel as well, correct? Yes, that is correct. Right. Well, we determined that um, the risks greatly outweighed the initial cost savings because we would more than likely have to repower uh, within the term of this uh, this grant and uh, the costs and <coughs> operating um, risks of, of a used vessel um, were it was it was it was it was just better better business to buy something new with a warranty and then and a fresh engine mm -hmm. uh, um, and drive gear are we at risk of losing substantial mooring fees or revenues from mooring fees if we don't have this? Is this a table stake kind of thing? There is, an, there is always that attenuate risk. It's a, pre a potential that's there. Um, your authority to charge mooring fees is based upon CRMC's giving you that authority. It's the bottom of the water is owned by the state. CRMC is, C represents the state. Um, that is always the, the risk. And people say, well, when will it occur? Well, do you want to be the test child? They, you know, they, they're starting to do, take some more aggressive actions over in Portsmouth where moorings have been sort of willy-nilly allowed to be located in uh, different locations, requiring people to remove moorings and that sort of thing. Um, the, the downside of losing the, the CRMC authority is literally the, the downside risk of losing that income stream. Um, when will it occur? I don't know. Uh, you know. There are very few guarantees in this world. We'll all die as one absolute, but um, it is the potential that exists. And so, I, you know, as I said, um, were this element to be not gone, accepted at this point, candidly, as chairman, you know, the first thing I'd have to do is contact Kevin Cute at CRMC and say, this element is no longer in our plan. Please make sure you know, you understand that, much to our chagrin, um, the planning, uh, Harbor Commission chagrin. See, presently right now we have a harbor management plan that's been approved by this council. Uh, we have the grant that was approved by this council on August 27th. Um, with these, with the harbor management plan and the approved grant, DEM is waiting for 
this final thing to give us our along with our town municipal code which comes up at your next town meeting uh, chapter 14 municipal code uh, once those are all completed and we have basically enforcement for our harbor management plan with the code um, then CRMC will approve the harbor management plan on contingency that DEM gives their water quality certificate and uh, the Army Corps of Engineers gives their certification um, Army Corps of Engineers our statements in there that complies with that they will give it theirs without a problem the water quality certificate will be the last thing we do not have an active harbor management plan right now we're running on our 1993 plan we have not had a new plan since 1993 it's supposed to be done every five years so we're way behind um, can DEM walk in tomorrow and say you have no active harbor management plan you don't have the right to pay to charge for mornings. Yes, they could. Will they? Who knows? It could be 10 years down the road. It could be tomorrow. We don't know that. That's where we stand. Okay. Mr. Sousa. Oh, I just have oh. one. Just sorry, Jim. Just one quick. Something just occurred to me. What is it easy to <coughs> to sort of break down what the or just anecdotally tell us what the makeup of the mooring holders are in the the um, we're talking about Fogland kind of area. I know we talk about we have different tranches of m mooring holder, okay. um, and but it occurred to me because we talk about Fogland as a uh, as a transient port, you know, a transient right. location. It's known as a destination harbor. Destination harbor. harbor. There we go. That's what it is. Um, do we? You know, I know if it, it, we're talking about different quality in the sense that of the mooring field is its ability to generate revenue for the right. town because if we have a, a mooring field of 10 moorings and they're all residents it's 50 bucks a year or 55 dollars a right. year or whatever but if they're out of town residents it's 325 it's 325 dollars a year um, do we have any idea what the the quality of those moorings are on a sort of monetary basis would be would we really because that's I the most at risk area if you specifically i can't tell you now okay right now right off the top of my okay. head i can get the records that's very simple okay, great. Okay. Uh, there are approximately 70 moorings in the fogland area and 60 moorings in nanaquaka pond those are the two areas that mm -hmm. are of big concern mm -hmm. uh, you just repeat that dave um so basically you're looking at you know uh, 130 approximately moorings out of our 416 mm -hmm. um, and we'll servicing those in the basement and such. right and, and oh, not only will we be servicing oh, those course, areas but course. we'll also yeah. be servicing you know Tiverton Basin mm -hmm. and the North End the North End has approximately 35 or so 40 moorings our largest incorporation of moorings is the Tiverton Basin mm -hmm. I mean the Tiverton Basin is probably 135 140 moorings in that area but you know, I just I, I'd be happy to look at those because right. that, that might inform a yeah. little bit even going forward. But you know, it would seem that if these are locations that are people are coming to from elsewhere, um, it has the potential of being uh, a significant driver. See, the thing is, even if we would even if we would tomorrow come in and ban every single morning, let's let's say we turned around and said, okay, all the people of Fogland, you can no longer have a morning unless you are a riparian mooring owner, property mm -hmm. owner, basically. Right. Uh, a waterfront property owner. If we were to come in tomorrow and say, nobody can have any moorings in Fogland, we're getting rid of them all, we're still responsible for Fogland. We're still responsible for all those transient boats that show up. They'll the town of Tiverton is yeah. still mm -hmm. responsible yeah. for all mm -hmm. that. Yeah, they can drop anchor. They'll just drop they anchor. can still yeah. drop yeah. anchor. And, right. right. Yeah. Okay. There are no pro there, they, don't, they don't treat an anchor drop as any different than just, uh, there's no regulation nope. you nope. can do. Okay. I, I apologize, but this issue just really boils me over because I feel as though the council is making a capital expenditure without public approval. The water quality issue, as Mr. Root had mentioned, I looked at DEM site. They do not know the cause, but the probable cause is because we had a heavy rain during that period and it was washed out from the fields from all the Canadian geese and birds that we have in this area. Everybody sees the Canadian geese. It's happening in a lot of towns. Uh, 
also looked at the DEM site quality. Marine just received the DEM grant to put in a pump out station. Also, uh, Brewer Marine and Kid Marine. So that's going to be four pump out stations. People that have invested their money, these are private companies that have invested their money in these stations in order to bring boats in to service them, sell them fuel and whatever supplies. And I don't believe that the town should be cutting into their. This is a, you now we're, we're actually interfering with their, you know, chance to employ people and make some money for their marinas and keep them going. The only other thing I'll say is the budget committee. I'm not speaking for the budget committee, but from what I understand, we have about $5 million in capital needs, and that doesn't even include the condition of our roads, which is probably several more million. And that's why we felt that the town cannot afford to add on any more liability, any more expenditures. We're, we're at a breaking point between additional pension costs and uh, we've been falling behind for years in equipment needs. And we're twisting people's arms just to buy fire trucks and ambulances. Now there's a private, four private companies that provide this service. I've seen a reason why we need to buy the boat to begin with, but former Councilor Leonard had mentioned uh, going to the legislature and looking for relief, and we didn't do that. We didn't ask Representative Edwards to put a bill in to give us a little bit of relief so that when DEM tells us we have to have a pump out boat because we're a half a mile out of the limit. I mean, let's, the bottom line is if these people are pumping their boat into the water, I don't want them in our waters anyway. If they're people like that, that means they're probably throwing their trash in the water as well. If they can't get off of their mooring and come over here into the harbor and pump out and pay the $5, and that's all we get is $5 for the pump out. It's not even going to cover the fuel to run that boat back and forth. So I'm just asking you to think wisely before we make a purchase that the voters didn't approve. Hi, Barbara Pelletier again. Um, I think one thing that you might be overlooking is the fact that if you own property on Fogland or Nanaquawket, uh, the discovery of E. coli will vastly reduce your property value and since most of these properties along the Fogland shore at least uh, many multi millions uh, and several of them are up for sale any resale of them would definitely affect the resale value and hence the tax revenue generated from the new resale would way 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 be out of proportion with what this boat is actually going to cost us. I, uh, that's just my guess. And I'm a riparian, mooring owner, et cetera, et cetera. And there are tons of people that use Fogland, the harbor, in the summer. They seem to have a good time. They sometimes stay there for days. They have little boats and whatever else out of there. And, and it's one of the attractions that we do have in town. Am I correct, Mr. Harbormaster? Absolutely. And I, I think we would be sh awfully short-sighted not to at least, and maybe the, the, the pollution is from geese, who knows? But we would be short-sighted not to give that little assurance to people who pay prime property taxes, who for the most part are no impact to the town because they rarely, rarely send children to school and they don't have trash out even in purple bags or whatever. So it, it's, it's, I think, a, a Oxymo I, I think it just doesn't make any sense for you to keep harping on the few thousand dollars that it might cost us compared to what the whole impact might be. And by the way, I don't think the people really dump trash overboard because I never find it on the beach and I walk the beach, so. Thank you. I, th I don't think they're really trash generators, but that's my thought. Okay, and I hope you'll preface yours as you normally do. Fun? No, I'm <laughs> That I'll be brief. I'll yeah. try. Although yeah. this, you know, gets my goat too, uh, for different reasons. Uh, just a few questions first, Mr. Gunslow. I heard you mention that we are signing on for a ten-year program. Yes. And if I'm not mistaken, the ramifications of not budgeting for the operational expense every year, and doing this service for the next ten years, would result in us having to 
pay DEM back for their portion of the grant? I believe so. So if the voters don't approve their budget, I mean, remember, this is the people's budget. We have an FDR, the people approve it. If they don't approve a budget that contains operating expenses for the pump out boat, then um, we either provide that service against the will of the people or we find the money for the grant. Which, you know, I have ought to about the initial capital expense not being approved by the people. I also have ought to about the council approving an ongoing operational service that the people haven't approved. There are pros and cons. In my opinion, if it's possible that the grant might still be available or we've gone through, as Mr. Pelletier mentioned, several iterations of possible votes, that we have this discussion through the budget season. And if the program is a viable program and we need it, we hear all sides, the people approve it, then we've done it the right way. Uh, just uh, one question that's kind of nitty, but I see on here on your um, budget that was passed out that the program has um, uh, whomever would be running it, whomever would be driving the boat, mm -hmm. 200 hours, five months, 20 weeks, 10 hours a week. Right. I guess I'm questioning the 10 hours a week and if we're gonna have a service that really provides a pump out service that would enable us to get our water quality certificate and you know, keep the water quality good so that we don't drive away the tourists, blah, blah, blah. What is 10 hours a week gonna get us? The, 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 the whole um, purpose of the pump out boat is to be able to empty the, the head. Um, if we are only have 30 boats to empty and if I run it for, if I get a guy out there for eight hours, it seems like we're wasting fuel, we're wasting men hours, so on and so forth. If I schedule it and I schedule it so that all these boats all have their flags up and we go from boat to boat to boat to boat to boat so that we're not going back and fall, back right, and right, fall, right. it, it, it kind of works much better if it's all scheduled within a time frame. You know, that, that way I so can walk So I, I guess what I'm asking, yeah, I guess what I'm asking is, um, I think Mr. Cox, you mentioned they have this program in Bristol. Hey, so, yes, so presumably this 10 hours a week is based off their average hours a week that they provide the service and Bristol that seems to work Bristol there? Bristol works three days a week. They okay. Three days a week. Mm -hmm. What's it? They, like they, work, they work on a focused, con it's mimicked, modeled somewhat after Bristol in the sense of the process of call in, put a flag up and it's remotely, your boat is remotely emptied. And that makes it more efficient for the operator of the pump out boat. Um, the hours that have been forecast are our best estimate at this point. It's uh, based upon a community that's had a successful program for more than a decade um, in Bristol and actually Warren as well. The um, the goal is not to have the boat on the water all weekend long. It's to have it on the water when people would be more uh, oriented towards, yes, please come clean out my, my okay. oil tank. Um, trying to be efficient. Because we're, we're, I mean, we're aware of the budget issues. Uh, we are a profit center. It's a, uh, when we actually, the, the mooring fees were increased last year by last year's council and we brought in an extra $16,000 in our budget. Approximately. Um, and, and you know, that is an indication as to what the mooring fees can in fact accomplish. The, the goal here is to be able to protect that and also protect the waters of, of Tiverton. That's right. this flat. I guess, I guess I'm not here to argue pro and con on whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. On, the, on its merits, I think it, it's definitely worth looking into. I don't know, I would want more specifics. Um, I would encourage the council to consider putting this into the budget process so it's done properly and also that consider the revenues. I have to slip this in because <laughs> it bugs me. Um, I understand the mooring fees, are they bring in money. Um, 
but all the revenues of the town go into the general fund. Mm -hmm. um, if it were the case that revenue centers got more resources, well, we'd have 25 people, 30 people in Mrs. Mello's office. So it's just something to keep in mind. No, Thank I'm you. not arguing it as a revenue center. I'm just explaining the issue. Okay. I'm going to try to be as brief as possible. I just have a few questions for Mr. Veneer and uh, Mr. Cox. If you were to get this boat, and there's no guarantee, can you guarantee the voters of Tiverton 100% that what happened at Fogland Beach this year with the pollution, that that will not happen again? No, and, and, and we said that previously. So why should we spend the $53,000 no, you're, this not boat spending, you're not spending $53,000. Or the amount. $53,000 is the total cost of the vessel. $13,400 approximately would be the cost to the town. The rest is a grant from Rhode Island DEM. The grant had to be accepted by a certain date in August or September. I forget exactly what the date was. The grant had to be accepted within that time. The grant also has to be completed within the May 30th, I think, date. Um, so in other words, the boat has to be purchased, manufactured, and ready to ready for service <coughs> by the end of May. Um, and if any in any budget cycle, you don't receive funding to put that boat in the water you owe within the within the, the within the ten years, we owe the owe the state back their fifty portion. Their, their portion of the budget, which means we just spent fifty three thousand dollars on a boat. That is correct. When we have a fire station in the north end of town Mr. that Belli, it's going Mr. Belli, I'm, I'm we're only discussing the boat here. I understand. I'm just saying we have this amount of money that we could possibly be fully spending on the boat. We have a fire station in the north end of town that's going to possibly need a $60,000 roof. I think this amount of money could be better spent by putting a roof on the fire station rather than spending it on a boat because we do have other pump out stations with, you know, within the basin which Mr. Sousa, I'm not going to go into, but Mr. Sousa has already pointed out some. You know, we do have Standish. We do have Pirate we, we, we Cove and Portsmouth. We were just you know, belaboring the issue. I'd so like to make a quick comment. And um, one, of the, one other question I just have for Mr. Veneer and Mr. Cox. I do have many friends that are boaters. They've owned boats all their lives. When you purchase a boat, aren't you told if the boat does have bathroom facilities, that is the responsibility of the boat owner to make sure that that boat is properly pumped out. Absolutely. And, and it is properly. De so it's not the responsibility it of the town to buy a pump out boat to make sure these people are doing the Isn't right it thing. It's their, own, it's their own responsibility. Okay. okay. We understand that. Thank you. Not to throw trash out the window of your car. But you still do. I mean, come on. Okay. What, is, um, what is the tolerance for increasing mooring fees? enough to cover what is the tolerance for increasing mooring fees this year to cover the 25 percent of the grant we did it last year, did it last year and to do well this no i understand yeah. that we did it last year i, I again is there a tolerance I, how much did it go up last year it uh, it's our overall increase um was five dollars five dollars residential and i think it was 75 dollars commercial and non-resident mm -hmm. The net, the net increase was some 16, 000, fifteen to sixteen thousand dollars over the prior year's in, uh, income stream. In terms of the tolerance from an economical pers economics perspective, um, you know, what is the elasticity of supply and demand? Sure. Um, we have a long waiting list. Uh, the cost of a mooring in Tiverton is still bargain. Uh, cost as contrasted with. Um, nearby Bristol, for instance. Bristol, as a resident, I believe is one hundred twenty-five. I now pay. 350 there for my non-resident mooring, which I also have there. Um, and you see we have a waiting list in the basin for non-residents as well as residents, and they don't hesitate to pay the, the 300 and change for those. Um, there are um, the recreational re uh, boat owners. Um, that industry is soft right now, but if someone wants to have a boat in the water, they will pay just about anything to have a mooring in the water. Um, not that I'm suggesting we go out and pirate these people. That would be inappropriate. But it, in fact, if there was increased cost associated with the operation of a pump-out boat, 
that would certainly justify an increased cost of the mooring fees. This year, our recommendation was that we not touch the mooring fees. I don't believe the town the council or Mr. Gonsal, whoever, asked us to come forward and exp address that. I think that's just gone forward um, as, as, as a normal course, probably a consent item. But the, uh, the theoretically elasticity is, is uh, it's very elastic. The demand is way beyond what the supply is. You, you, we're in, you're in billing season now, aren't you? Our bills have gone out. Our charter requires that the bills go out actually in December. Yeah. And that's part of why we waited and we waited. Uh, and they actually went out just at the cusp of December, beginning of January. They've now gone out and everything has been out, and I'm already starting to get some back. We have some in the back room. What, um, <laughs> what, Dave? What was the end result of there was a potential opportunity to get a dock space or a slip or that opportunity still may exist. Okay. Uh, I have not approached her on that presently because I'm waiting. For final approval, correct. I don't have a boat to put on the dock. So and that would save us somewhere right. in the vicinity of about three thousand dollars a year. Which That's is correct. That's correct. Sizable amount of money sure. for our, our docking fee. That's correct. Hey, just just a quick question: the the proposed boat is that already been built? Is that a, a, a it has stock not. Item? They're waiting at the present time for approval of the bid mm -hmm. before they can build it, and they need it right away. As a matter of fact, he wants me to send him an email tonight if it gets approved. If I might just add a note uh, regarding the fees. We look at these fees annually, and yes, there's no increase at this point. Okay, but we could increase the fees next year. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, and it would still be in the same fiscal year. That's correct. As the expense. Are we doing a, a review, review of all the fees? Review of <coughs> the fees. The, the fees you actually have installed right now and the, the bills that I sent out are actually for this fiscal year. Yeah. Presently. Yeah. It's not for next year. I have a couple more questions uh, about the boat itself. So this roughly what the boat would look like, basically? That is correct. That is correct. So I'm also... I went up like to... Uh, I've been to... Uh, Fairhaven and to Bourne, Mass to see actual vessels from this company in the water being operated by their hop masters. And they're very pleased. But myself, I, you know, I'm not uh, very ignorant to boats as well. Never owned a boat, uh, probably never will have one. I have to get proof from the wife to get there. <laughs> but uh, <coughs> um, will a vessel this size really be able to service? You mentioned roughly 160 moorings in that's service? That's correct. There's 100. Approximately 160. That Will this effectively service all those vessels? Well, I mean, this, this, this is a very large to me. It it's has a 200. you got to remember, most holding tanks are going to be anywhere from 5 to 30 gallons. They're okay. Be anywhere between 5 and 30 gallons. This has a 250-gallon or 270-gallon holding tank. Um, so, you know, um, 5 gallons you know, uh, for most pump outs. And you estimate 10 hours per week in Ten service? Hours per week. We're uh, planning on operating it from like 9 to, you know, uh, 1, 2 in the afternoon on a Saturday and a Sunday. So I, I also, during that time, when the boat isn't in service and people have, they, I guess they all of a sudden have a full. They can pick head. up the radio and contact us. And you can go. And we'll go over to them and. For that one help assist them, yes. For that one boat, if necessary. Yeah. And what would the what would be possibly charge for fees? Fees can only be charged five dollars per thirty gallons. So per thirty gallons. So if five dollars. Five dollars if it's five gallons. Five dollars if it's two gallons. Five dollars if it's thirty gallons. If it becomes a sixty gallon holding tank, it turns to ten dollars. So if you have that boat out there, oh, I need a I need a pump out. You estimate on how far would a trip would usually on an average you think that would be. As far as uh, like how far would the boat would have to travel? Well, it depends. See, possibly. I, I mean, if, if somebody calls and says I'm in the Tiffany Basin and I need it, I'm not gonna. If I'm have somebody servicing Fogland right now, he's gonna continue to service Fogland and then meet that person over in Tiffany Basin. So he'll finish his 
duty cycle before right. he, he'll put that to his schedule. So we try to avoid as many trips back and forth. I don't want to be right, running that's the point I'm back getting to at. Fogland, back to the tip right, of That's the point I'm getting at. For $5, I mean, uh, it's, no, it's I, $5 I, to start the boat. No, I, so. I don't want to be running back. From a practical perspective of boat operation, the recreational boater, just as you will not run your car to empty before you add fuel to your tank, the recreational boater, even more so, will not fill his tank and then call for the pump out. If he sees the pump out in the area, he'll take advantage of the opportunity to anticipate future demand for that holding capacity because when it's full, you have a problem. You have to tell if you're fortunate enough to have a boat and a wife on board, your wife, no, darling, you can't. Um, or that ilk. Or you have to break the law. And by the way, breaking the law here is with it about a thousand dollar fine. That's how serious the state takes it. If someone catches them, exactly. if, you catch them. Mm -hmm. that's if you catch them, that's the thing. So I guess the only point would be is it, we have a limited amount of hours. The boat will be on the water. The boat obviously might be able to handle enough uh, a good percentage of the 160, right. but there's no guarantee that people will stop dumping into the water. Now, now, to add one other thing, um, Mr. Sousa made a good comment about all these places that are pump-out locations. And, and a matter of fact, there are additional ones. Like if you go to the DEM website, you'll find Starwoods is a pump-out facility. You'll find um, Quality Yachts. You'll find even the Tiverton Yacht Club are pump-outs. Well, guess what? You can't pump your boat out at Tiverton Yacht Club because there's no facility. You can't pump your boat out at Starwoods because there's no facility there. Even though they're listed in the DEM website, you can't pump your boat out at Quality Yachts because there's nothing there. There is no pump-out facility. So these pump-out facilities, some of them that are listed on the <coughs> website, do not exist. Now, yes, there's brewers across the way in the North End. Absolutely. They, that's in Portsmouth. It's not listed in Tiverton. There's, uh, there's um, Pirate Coal. That's also listed in Portsmouth. It's not listed in Tiverton. So, just fun. For me, um, you just said something that kind of was a good, concise thought, that it's, it's a very serious issue to be dumping your, your very tank into the water, and it carries with it a penalty of $1,000 if you're caught. If you can catch it. The problem is, we don't catch anybody. Right. So not only are we left without the thousand dollars we're left with a potentially a river or at least our shore full of unsavory material so we we do have a somewhat of a responsibility to acknowledge that and say well people aren't supposed to do this but they are in all likelihood they are i mean we can say that it's geese or it's cows that their manure runs into the but you know, at some point we have to acknowledge that uh, some of our own visitors and hopefully not our own residents are abusing the privilege of owning a boat in having a mooring in an area that is hard to get a pump to a pump out facility, and so they just let it loose. Um, and that's a problem we have to wrangle with. That's we have to to at least take a swing at a solution to that problem. Um, and I think, you know, as much as we can reduce the impact of both our environmental follies and our financial um, constraints, uh, I think we can do that. And, 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 and uh, kudos to these two gentlemen for looking at sources that would allow us to house the boat for free, um, saving us $3,000 potentially. So that's something to consider. And also, there were there was discussion about you know I hope I'm not telling tales out of school but that in other communities it's five dollars to pump out your boat on a Sunday afternoon when you're getting ready to go back home but oh do you have a bag of trash we'll take that too for an extra five bucks so there's also we make sure that we're not provi we're we're providing we're, we're taking away the incentive or we're creating a disincentive for people to dispose of their, or d dump their tanks in our waters, and also the potential for proper recycling and trash disposal, so we don't end up with things floating in the water and everything else. Um, and it can, I'm not saying it's going to 
solve all the financial problems in the world, but it can contribute to the financial feasibility if you're talking about bottom lines. I've never heard any line item in a budget or any operation of this uh, department in this town as a net loser or a net gainer. I, I just that, that terminology just does not, I do not buy that for a second because there are plenty of departments in every company, in every town, in every organization that generate revenue and those that on a net basis and those that absorb revenue on a net basis. And to weigh that as a po saying, well, this is a bad idea because it's not, it's, it doesn't break even on its own when we have just realized 16 some thousand dollars in revenue increases from the same department and attributing no credit to that. So you got to sort of balance those two things as well. Um, and I don't think we're, we're up here making a decision as to whether to harpoon the town financially. This is a responsible decision that we need to make one way or the other. Um, and it's not, it's not uh, I don't know, I don't like this characterization that this is, um, that we can ignore the threats and ignore what we know to be true and, and still make a reasonable uh, decision going forward for the town. I just I, well, I don't disagree with your sentiments at all. Um, Brett, uh, I'm just weary of, you know, again, my experience, someone who is honest obviously will use the pump out boat and the people who are dumping in the water will continue to dump into the water, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, the thing is, is that we're going to spend uh, this much money to maintain the boat for 10 years and we have to spend that unless we uh, we'll lose the grant. So is that are we actually is it actually worth spending that money I mean, are we really preventing that from happening i would assume yes i, I hope think, it's yes I think we provide i think that the thesis of why these are successful in other in other seaside and, 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 and coastal communities is because you are you are left with a situation especially in fogland and especially in uh, uh nanaquocket that the alternatives are very few, or they don't exist at all. And when, when you're short on time, or you're heading back to wherever you're, you're going on a Sunday evening, because you've spent a nice weekend in, in Fogland, you're not really going to turn your vessel around and go north to Standish to pump out your boat, and then come back down south and head out, out, out to the Atlantic, or wherever you're going, I mean, or wherever these people are coming from. So the alternative is, I either take it home with me, or I dump it on the way. Um, I think if you ask someone if they're going to spend a, a half an hour, 45 minutes, crossing the Sakana River to go to, you know, to kids or to go to brewers way up north, that they're going to think that that's time well spent. I think five dollars is a no-brainer to anybody that that runs a boat and sa at that capacity and has a has a tank full of. I mean, it's, it, it's material you don't want to be trekking around with you um, just as much as you don't uh, really want to be dumping it into the ocean. So you provide an easy, painless, relatively painless, it's $5. Um, it's a gallon of fuel, but it's $5. Uh, you know, and hopefully, I mean, uh, you, you, you alleviate the need for people that the, the, the thought they think they need to just dispose of it in the water. I think it is worth it. I think the water quality of our our coastal air, I mean, what, we're the second longest coastline in the state of Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a very delicate uh, asset that uh, is only tolerant to so much abuse. And uh, when we know something isn't quite right, I think we have an obligation uh, to the people that we serve to protect it and to restore it to something that resembles clean and healthy waters. I agree with you, and uh, I am not giving the sentiment that I don't, I don't care about the shoreline. No, I know, I'm just... This is, you know, I'm playing basically devil's advocate on behalf of the taxpayer, and we're getting, you know, well, we have the E. coli situation, and I have a hard time basically believing the justification <coughs> that getting the boat is gonna help that situation, because I don't really think it will. I think that's one one prong in a multi-pronged uh, problem or right. uh, solution. I think one of the one of the solutions is we try to reduce some of the E. coli and try to reduce some of the 
closures of, of, um, of the waterways there. Another one is providing a service. Another one is, you know, making it, it, there's somewhat of an ambassadorship to this as well. Tiverton has become a place where people can take their boats for the day and enjoy a beautiful scenery and a beautiful place to swim and all <coughs> these other things that I think that amenity is just that. It's an amenity that makes Tiverton more attractive. And when we're so very focused going forward on creating more access to the water and l restricting it less, I think, um, for me anyway, it's, it's a fairly simple exercise. Yeah, I'm just basically f trying to fig you know, s figure out, is this the only option we have to solve this possible problem? I mean, are there other ways to also do it that may not uh, you know, and cost as much? I know I'm talking to forever, years, but well, I, I think, yeah. you know, first of all, I mean, we have some other issues that are coming up uh, that we have to uh, take care of. Uh, and I don't think we're going to uh, come to a consensus at this point in time. I think there's some other information that we all need to, to uh, put together. And I understand you're under constraints, uh, but the same token, I think that we need to, to take a long, hard look at this. Um, I, for one, believe that, that uh, the pump-up boat is something that is needed. Uh, I think it only enhances the town. Uh, making us a destination. Uh, you know, we talk about what does Tiverton stand for uh, and who are we. I mean, one of the assets we have is our shoreline and anything that makes it more desirable, I think, uh, is beneficial to the entire town. Um, so at this point in time, I would ask the council if there is any uh, movement uh, they want to make on this issue. Uh, let, let me explain my vote. It would be about 30 seconds. What I found in four years on the town council is that we have a tremendous number. We have a f tremendous number of volunteers who work on our boards and committees, and I, I, I realize and appreciate that they're working on any number of issues that, for the most part, one I don't have time to handle, simply being on the town council. And number two, I have absolutely no interest in. That said. On a lot of these issues where they are close and where there are so many factors and questions involved, my approach, and this is the rule I've adopted, is that I simply defer to the board or commission. They've put hours into this. They've put weeks into it. In fact, I know some committees <coughs> and some of the proposals that they've come forward with have put a year into the project, have put two years, have put three years into the project. And I don't expect, even in an effort to play the devil's advocate, with all due respect, uh, Jim, that I'm ever going to ask all of the right questions that these people have considered over a period of one or two years. So uh, I, I'm not trying to uh, suggest how peop what, what, what approaches people should adopt. Uh, you, you learn your own lessons as you go along. But I find on these type of issues like this, I finally say, well, gee, do I have a lot of confidence in these people? We appointed them. Are they doing a good job? Do people look up to them as, a, 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 and have a, an understanding that they know what they're doing and what they're talking about? And if I say, yeah, yeah, I do, uh, I defer to their judgment. And so I would not have any difficulty at all in making a motion. And the motion I'd like to make at this point is for approval of the bid award for the pump out boat for 56600 uh, $53,665 to Base Sales Marine, Inc., Wellfleet, Massachusetts, subject to meeting all legal requirements. We have a motion. Second. And a second. Any Just one question. Yeah. Um, this is to the town administrator. Uh, have you identified funding from the current bu budget that would cover the $13,416 match to the no, grant? I no, I haven't. Uh, uh, just no, a follow up to that. Oh, sorry, Jim. Go on. Not at this point. Would uh, that be reduced by? I'm sorry, Bill. Yeah. Would that be? Re uh, would that be reduced by the amount we received for, for Marine One? No. So what happens to the, the money? The money we receive from Marine One goes into the general, general fund. So my question is, is that, and I appreciate everyone's time being new to this. I really do appreciate everyone's time so that I could get up to speed. Um, it sounds like there's, uh, based on the 
supply and demand um, comments by Mr. Cox, I don't see why we should not look into how we might be able to make up the difference, the 13,000 however much for the, the balance of the grant by increasing fees. Yeah, would not be in this fiscal year. Yeah. No, Jimmy's. Increase, we could increase the fees to cover the operational cost, or at least mitigate some of the operational cost next year. Okay, but as far as purchasing the boat and our match, <coughs> you know, the, the, the fees or the, the uh, invoices have gone out. We need to spend that money this year. So increasing the fees would mitigate the cost next year. Okay. For the operation, not for the purchase. I definitely think that that's something that we should look into. Is there still the option to, to purchase this boat next year? No, you lose the. Would you lose the? I think we'd have to lose the grant next year. The grant yeah. will be going yeah. as of May 30th. If we don't as of May 30th. We don't accomplish that as the grant is going. <coughs> so if we didn't add it to the budget process, it would we got to pay for the whole boat. Just one last comment. I, I do believe, being a boater for over 25 years, I do believe that boaters are responsible and that they do take the necessary steps to maintain their boats, which includes um, maintenance of their uh, waste on their boat. I don't think you can say that the majority of, of the boaters out there trash the water. They don't. They know that they're, they're responsible. They know there are fines. They have plaques on their boats. They get inspections from the Coast Guard's um, auxiliaries and such to, to get stickers on their, on their boat. They are, are stopped by the Coast Guard, make sure they have everything uh, that's required. Um, so I don't think that the um, boaters, um, I think the majority of them are responsible. Also, I don't think that we should put it on the backs of our mooring holders where the mooring holders are not necessarily boats that have uh, sewerage facilities. So they could be just skiffs. They, they, could, they may not have a porta potty. They, or they may have a porta potty that's removable and they pick it up and they bring it to their own home and dispose of the waste. So I don't think we should put it on the backs of our mooring holders to pay for this uh, facility um, or this service. Uh, there are responsible boat owners and they do know where the pump out stations are. Now there may be only one in the Tiverton Basin that's in Tiverton, but there are multiple pump out stations. So to say that there's not one available, there, there are pump out stations available and if a, a boater is coming from a marina and they're laying anchor at Fogland um, to enjoy the day, they most likely have pump out facilities where they are moored, where they are at their marina, because marinas generally have pump out facilities. So I don't see this as, you know, you're going to solve the problem of E. coli and all that. There is runoff. We, we know that from, we know that there's runoff from uh, failed septic systems that run into the water. So it's not, you can't put, just put, the uh, pollution on the backs of boaters, because it's not true, unless you actually <laughs> see them dumping at Fogland. I don't think you can say that they're responsible for all the um, pollution at that particular point in time that caused a, a, a shutdown. Though the water at Fogland does move pretty swiftly because it is part of the river, and the river has a tide, and it comes in and it comes out. So I don't. I don't see that. Um, I think this has to have um, budgetary approval by the citizens of the town. I agree with the budget committee on that point. I think it's it's an expense, and certainly, um, I think we it, if it's a 10-year commitment for services that we couldn't just try it for a couple of years and say, oh, this is not really working out so well. Um, are there any other opportunities? Are there any other um, things that we can share with other towns in the basin? Um, does 
Portsmouth have a pump out boat? I don't think so. Yeah. What, what does Little Compton do? I'm sure they have moorings, and I should, certainly they do have boats in their harbor down at Taconic Point. What are they doing? So I think there's, you know, if a little bit more uh, attention needs to be um, given to what other towns in our particular area do. To compare us to Bristol, <coughs> Bristol is definitely a destination. It has a, a safe harbor. It has a lot of boats. It has a lot of building uh, companies over there. It is a harbor town, and it has a lot of activities, including the 4th of July parade that involves people, a lot of people going to that destination. So I think our situation here in Tiverton is a little different. It's not so much those destinations as um, you can't compare us apples to apples with um, Bristol. So that's my opinion on, on this topic and certainly we can move the, uh, move the question. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Anything further? Okay. All those in favor? Opposed? It's a tie. Motion fails. Uh, council members, can I ask a question? Um, just a quick question. Um, where do I go now? What do I do from here? I tell DEM that we're not accepting the grant. Is that exactly what happens right now? Yeah, you'll either okay. either that right. or, that's, that's or, all I need or request to, to come before the council again. Thank you. Okay, yep. uh, town administrator. Just to uh, give you where we are with tax collections, <coughs> as of today, we are point. 1.5% ahead of last year in tax collections, which amounts to about $55,000. Not a big number, but at least we're not losing ground. Uh, the Rhode Island Interlocal Trust is having an annual dinner. Uh, the counselors are invited. Apparently it's short notice. We need to respond by January 17th. It is January 24th at the, um, it's that big hotel in Warwick near the airport. Crown Plaza. Plaza, that's it. Uh, that's where it is. Uh, if, you con if you're interested in attending, you can contact me and I'll put in your reservation. But it's due by January 17th. Uh, recycling. December of 2011, we recycled 173 tons of material. December of 2012, we recycled 172 tons of material. Uh, just one note, our, our uh, free bag for mm -hmm. December, the week after Christmas, we normally generate 20 cubic yards per day during that period of time, we generated 80 cubic yards per day, uh, four times as much as, as the regular, and that's, that was each day during that week. Um, that equates to about four months annually on our landfill. Uh, so I don't know whether it's a practice we should continue or not, but we have time to discuss that. That's all I have. Thank you. Council announcements, comments, and questions? Mr. President, I have one. Um, the Tibetan Arts Council is holding a reception on January 20th from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock here at the Town Hall. This, rep uh, this reception features the work of local artists, uh, John Bergeron, Yvonne Nolan and Richard Sardina. As you can see, the pictures are displayed on the walls at the, on the town hall. Everyone is invited to attend uh, this reception to view, re, to view the artwork. Um, that is actually the artwork is for sale, uh, for those that didn't know that, and also to meet the artists. So if you can attend, please join us on January 20th. Is that 
that's that, you say, what time is that, Jim? Two, Two to four, January 20th. And I believe the football game is at 6.30, so it <laughs> should be fine for all our Pats fans who are also <coughs> fans of uh, paintings uh, that can come and, and enjoy um, the, Will they have the any of Tom Brady there? I might we buy one of those. Tom Brady. <laughs> a painting of Tom Brady. I might buy one. That might have been a good idea. Only if they win the Super Bowl. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, this, is, this is basically for town council announcements. Comments and questions for town council, not the public? No. No, this is our own announcements. <laughs> okay. You, you actually, in the beginning, I don't know if this is the first time you've been here, there's a sheet that goes out. Second time. Okay, well, in, in the very beginning, mm -hmm. when, when Mrs. Pelletier came up, yes, sir. that is the portion that the public in. But if you have a, a brief question, I'll allow it this time. I just have a comment. My, wa uh, my name is Brian Pay, and uh, we've, we were one of the proposals for non-quit school. My wife and I, Michelle Souza, we felt uh, very passionate about the school and saving the school and its reputation. And we feel that it was deserving enough to at least uh, get proposals and statements from the, at least the top three bidders. Uh, we don't know the, the winning bidder or, or her proposal, but we were prepared to give our entire lives to this place. And uh, I feel like the decision was made a little hastily and uh, after being in this meeting uh, I see that other decisions may uh, be subject to the same uh, process and I, I feel sorry for Tiverton that that's the case because things like non-quit school deserve more than the the time that a trash bag situation gets given. Thank you. Um, moving on, the questions. No, it's not. It's not. It's not. No, yeah, it's, it's, like, uh, it's, it's not on our agenda. We're not. It's not our purview to speak on it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. For it, it's, it's it's the, it's the it's legality. Done. Yeah, it's done. Okay. But there are okay. many. Okay, other that's it. All right, um, we had a discussion. Uh, we had a discussion regarding uh, the budget committee meeting, uh, two dates. Uh, I believe it was the 17th and the 24th. And uh, some had said that uh, the 17th was not uh, workable. Uh, I think the 24th would work. That's the meeting with the uh, budget committee? Yep. Okay. At the high school. At the high school. No, no, uh, it no would that be would be here. here. It would be yeah, here. Yeah. It's their normal budget. Still, right. still at seven o'clock. Right, still at seven o'clock. Yeah. Uh, the the no, only thing that I, I um, ask is that you know obviously we send seven uh, thirty our, our request that we be there for the twenty fourth to meet with the budget committee. But prior to that, and I know it's it's uh, tough, but we should look at the calendar to see if we can uh, get a a meeting together. Uh, prior to that, because uh, I think we need to look at the budget and uh, maybe uh, look at some other things before we. Uh, obviously, I know it's still a work in progress, but. Uh, the next one day to follow up. Yeah. <coughs> the 24th is Um This Wednesday is that water meeting. Right. Thursday's the budget committee. Right, which I believe the school committee is going to. If you weren't, I, I'm yeah, sorry, I missed that. So you're coming on the 24th? Right. Can I, just while Nancy is looking, stick in something else, if, if there are any general topics that you want to discuss, could you? I, I will know. let Nancy know. Yeah, so that we have, no, I, don't, I mean, it shouldn't be just a one-way discussion. It should be a two-way discussion. Yeah. So if there are big topics you want to bring up, okay. Then I'll let the new school committee know. Thank you. Your Laura, Laura. They're, they're, your meetings are usually at 7.30, correct? 7.30, yes. 7.30 Thursday night. Yeah. Thank you. 
except in the planning board meeting Tuesday. So the only schedule I see here open is next Tuesday, the 22nd, or Friday, the 18th, unless you do a weekend. Well, the only weekend prior to that is the holiday weekend, right? The holiday is on Monday, so unless you made on the workshop, but the Tuesday, the 22nd, because we're going to meet on the 24th. We only have that for the 18th, which is Friday. Saturday. Well, again, it's preliminary. I, I think um, if anyone has uh, specific we areas. Meet prior to the budget. Yeah, we could meet prior. If you just try not. Yeah. I don't care about meeting on Saturday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a holiday weekend, so this weekend I think would, would be out. Yeah, I might have a principal work commitment for Saturday, so. Yeah, I know that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Just, just, uh, that's actually this particular Saturday. Yeah. Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm not the first for me going over it, but I think I'm trying to get Unless you want to meet Monday, the holiday at night. It's not King Day. I'll be coming back. I'm, I'm so it's up to you. Um, can, can I make a suggestion that we meet at uh, 645 prior to the budget committee meeting? Will that give us enough time? Well, I, again, yeah. it's, it's it's all preliminary, but I think we just need to look at some areas of it and sure. say, okay, you know, we're interested in, in maybe attacking this particular area. Because, again, it's preliminary. We still have to have more meetings on the budget before okay. we finalize it. If Mr. Council has any changes, yes. get it to us, meet by Monday so I can email them out. Yeah, I don't have any changes at this point in time right now. But the only thing I would have most likely would be the uh, the same budget that we're looking at now. I don't have I can remove that yeah all right so if it, if it works everyone 645 on uh, the 24th 24. prior to the budget committee meeting mm -hmm. we have to post that as a workshop we all yes the yeah. Anyway, yeah. So I'll just post it I may be late okay Six forty-five. Uh, Six forty-four. Six forty-five yeah. on Thursday, the twenty-fourth. We'll we'll try to dra drag fair. our feet to in case you're late. Private budget. Yeah, that's gonna be tight for me too. Yeah. I'll do my best. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Okay. Town solicitor. N nothing in open session. Lot in executive session. Okay. 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 People waiting. Okay. Town clerk. Um. I have that resolution, but I just have one other item, not to belabor it, but Mr. Pay, was it? Um, we have all copies of the proposals when we're done with the meeting. Okay. She'll give you a copy, and they right. are available, and they're Thank public, you. okay? And the Thank purchase you. and sale is public. Right. And um, secondly, uh, Mrs. Pelletier just wanted me to mention, she brought into the uh, clerk's office about two or three weeks ago a big box of information newspaper articles everything on non quit school for us to kind of archive here mm -hmm. for her. and I thought before bringing them downstairs to the archive I can't keep them forever in our office but we're gonna leave them there in case anybody wants to come in I mean it's yearbooks of the school it's all articles I mean it's, I found it interesting and I didn't have anyone go to non quit school so that is available in the clerk's office for anybody that wants to go and see it one other item is the legislators. Um, I was contacted by two of the legislators. They're wondering when the council would like to have them come before them, if you have any issues um, or any needs that you're going to want to put legislation in, uh, where they're going on some of this legislation, and they, one in particular seems pretty anxious to come and meet with the council. Is there any date that the council would like to meet with them? I know they're meeting with Portsmouth tonight, so I suggested the 28th. No, I, I mean, I mean, normally we, we try to work it within their schedule. I mean, okay. Available. So you think the 28th? So will if put they're available on the 28th, that okay. works for us. Okay, that's fine. I'll send out an invitation to them. Yeah. Other than and that, lastly, it's you have the resolution. resolution. Yes. This is um, to ensure that we are going to be requiring the uh, IDs used at our community <coughs> town referendums as well. You know, it doesn't fall under election laws, so we need to set resolution by the council this week. Do you want to please? Tom Timidon, resolution requiring voter ID at financial town referendums. 
whereas RIGL 17-1-24-2 states, beginning on January 1, 2012, any person claiming to be a registered and eligible voter who desires to vote at a primary election, special election, or general election shall provide proof of identity and, whereas voter ID strengthens the public's faith in the fairness of our elections by enabling poll workers to match the voter's face to the name that they give at the polls, and whereas the Secretary of State's Office Election Division has made free voter ID cards available to all registered voters who lack an acceptable current and valid photo ID and whereas Title 17 of the Rhode Island General Laws does not apply to local referendums and whereas requiring proof of identity of all, at all local referendums would provide continuity in voting procedures for all registered voters. Now therefore, we the Town Council of the Town of Tiverton resolve that registered voters in the Town of Tiverton shall be required to provide proof of identity at all local referendums. A witness thereof, I have hereunto set my hand and seal this 14th day of January 2013, and that would be assessed by the town uh, clerk, Nancy L. Mello. So if we could have a motion. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay. Five to one. At this time, Mr. President, I, I move that we uh, go into closed executive session pursuant to Rhode Island General Law for Chapter 42, Section 465A2.